Here we go. As you heard. Well, good afternoon, Sam. Um, and good thank afternoon, you for Charles. your time. It's a, <laughs> and it's a Sunday afternoon, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for, for having you know, me. <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, I've been working on a book for the last uh, three years, and there's so much of you in the book. Your, you know, I've obviously read your. Oh, um, sounds like an obituary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your uh, malignant uh, self love narcissism revisited. She have to mirror you and say the way you say. Um, but I've also watched, you know, so many of your seminars, and so you're in my head a lot. So my apologies. As I've got to this, well, that's okay. We'll we'll let you off this time. But uh, <laughs> yeah. the author. The author that I've been working with suggested <clears throat> that I do an interview with you. And I thought that would really be uh, a, a, a really good idea. And you know what I didn't do in the other ones was ask you about what you've been doing. I mean, you're a, a pioneer in this field. You've been doing it a long time. You've written books. You've, you know, you've had a YouTube channel for a long time. You've also, you know, write about, write about the role in uh, Cronons in Time Asymmetry, which, of course, I helped you with. Um, so maybe you can uh, tell us about yourself, Sam. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a professor of psychology, author of uh, books. I don't think we should focus on me. Let's focus on my work. It's, I think, hopefully more interesting. I mean, sort of in terms of all the, you know, for the lot, I think you started doing this in 1994, 95. So, yes, I, 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 mean, I, I, was the I was the first to, um, to, own a website on narcissism in 1995 and I've been alone for nine years. The second website opened in 2004. I also ran the first six support groups for victims of narcissistic mm -hmm. abuse. Narcissistic abuse is a phrase that I coined in 1995 and at that time I also coined the entire language that is in use today. Well, 90, 99% of it that is in use today. So People don't even realize that I, I coined um, flying monkeys and you know mm. this kind of, mm. this kind of things. Yes, um, cerebral narcissists, somatic narcissists, narcissistic abuse, etc., mm. etc. Et and then I borrowed terms from the early psychoanalytic schools of, of uh, thought in psychology. So, for example, I borrowed the term narcissistic supply, mm -hmm. and I redefined it in the way that it is used today. Um, originally in the 1930s, narcissistic supply had meant the <coughs> relationship between essentially selfish, unavailable parents and their children. Mm. Um, but I redefined it completely, and the way it is used today is any form of external input which a narcissist uses to regulate his internal environment, his cognitions, mm -hmm. his emotions, his moods, mm -hmm. etc. So that's that's a common. So I, I I did I also took I I borrowed many many terms. I borrowed, for example, the true self and false self from Donald Winnicott, mm. Winnicott's work. And again, I redefined them to apply specifically to narcissism, because in Winnicott's work, they don't necessarily apply to narcissism. <coughs> Actually, they apply to developmental psychology. I borrowed the um, the cycle of of the narcissist. So that's idealization, evaluation. And I added to it two phases, discard and replacement, et cetera, et cetera. So I had, I had to single-handedly come up with the whole discipline because there was nobody there. And there was no language to communicate these highly idiosyncratic experiences, highly, highly personal. It's a little like a mystical experience. How do you communicate a mystical experience? It's like, how do you communicate? Yes. How do you communicate an experience of narcissistic abuse? Yeah in the absence mm. of a language. Mm. Of a language. No language. Yeah. Allow me one second. Yeah. Turn on the lights. So there was simply no, no language. And, and then when, the, when, when I came up with the language, which took about two years, suddenly people had a way of, of sharing <coughs> their experiences. And mm. actually sharing their, their experiences first and foremost with themselves. In other words, becoming aware. And so they became aware and then they, they formed like-minded groups and they discussed these issues in these groups, et cetera, et cetera. And for nine years, I was doing all this alone. And, and then in 2004, 
People discovered there's money in it and the avalanche started. As simple as that. And then YouTube came. I had the first YouTube channel on narcissism. I still have. And and many others entered the field. I am not quite sure that it's been a beneficial process because the word had been the word narcissism had been debased and and bandied around mm. in all the wrong ways. It became a pejorative or a curse word. And many, many people who had entered the field are totally unqualified <coughs> and are distributing misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And many of them, even with academic degrees, even with advanced academic degrees, and even with advanced academic degrees in psychology, are not experts in narcissism. Psychology is a giant field. You need, you need you know, and they are not. They simply are not. So they, there's a commercial there's a commercial corruption of of the whole thing, which had reached monumental mm. monumental proportions. There are tens of millions mm. of members of support groups for narcissistic abuse. And what I'm hearing online is is <coughs> blood blood curdling, absolutely spine chilling. <laughs> The, I would say that for every one correct bit of information, precise bit, something that relies on studies and research, and mm. for every one, there's about 99 that are wrong. And some of them are dead wrong. Wow. Some of them are dead wrong, like exactly the opposite of what. But there is demonization of narcissists. So you need yeah. to demonize them. Yeah. And you have this stupid list. Yeah. You have this stupid list, like 10 things you, you need to know about this and 10 things you need to know about that. And you have, of course, all kinds of wild, wild outgrowths and uh, a movement of essentially covert narcissists who call themselves empaths and super empaths. empaths yes. And so on. <laughs> they are definitely yeah. narcissistic people. They're grandiose. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like everything else, like everything else, the internet had not been good ultimately. If I have to look book, and I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest guy in the block. I invented the block. If I if yeah. I if I look back, no, it's not <clears> been <throat> beneficial. It's not. I I think all in all, it had there was more damage than, than help, in my view. The vast majority of people get stuck in the victimhood phase. They they adopt a victimhood as a, as a form of identity, and they can't progress. Yeah. They can't break out. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, what is your your own fascination with with the subject? Because you obviously find it so fascinating. It, it's so interesting to you. What is your interest? Your well, it started with the fact that I've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice. But mm -hmm. I've progressed a lot more since then in my perception of narcissism. I think mm -hmm. narcissism is an organizing principle of, of modern civilization. And also an explanatory hermeneutic principle, a principle that allows us to make sense of life and the environment and so on. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think narcissism is a form of religion, actually, um, a missionary religion. I think narcissists are trying to convert non-narcissists to their religion, and very successfully so. I think um, I think narcissism is. Um, um, embedded now inextricably in social institutions and structures mm -hmm. in in careers in dating in uh, in relationships intimate relationships uh, it, <clears throat> it had come it had come to be modern civilization so it's a now much much wider field much wider field so you know we analyze politicians we ask are they narcissists when we yeah. see when we see all kinds i am hard pressed to come across a movie or a book which doesn't include the word narcissism or narcissist hard press i'm, I'm serious i watch movies yeah. i read books and there's always at the end or in the middle or in the beginning somewhere there's the word narcissist narcissism and so on. so people make sense of the world through this there's been a series a television series called in treatment <laughs> it's about a therapist now the series yes. I know it. I know it well. Yes. Yeah, it's a wonderful series, and it's three seasons. Yes. It's three seasons. Yes. Now it may come as a shock to you, even though you had watched it. It may come as a shock to you. In the entire series, there's no mention of depression, no mention of borderline personality disorder, no mention mm. of any clinical label 
except one, narcissistic personality disorder. And it appears in the series eight times. NPD is mentioned eight times in, in treatment to the exclusion of all other labels. I mean, you witness depression, you witness patients with borderline personality yeah. disorder, but no clinical label is used except NPD, and that's eight times. That tells you a lot. This is a hot button topic in academia. Uh, it it <clears throat> brings me to my next point. I emailed um, one of the top universities in South Africa, the head of psychology, and I said, who specializes in narcissistic personality disorder and narcissistic abuse? No one. And, you know, the Sam, I, the, the person that I was involved with, uh, who was a, a, a covert somatic narcissist, often accused me of being a narcissist. And in those days, I thought, well, okay, maybe she's trying to say I'm a little bit grandiose or self-centered. I didn't know what the word meant. And I think if we look at, for example, the concept of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's been around since 1935. Everybody knows if you have a drinking problem, that's the, way, the place to go. But here is a different story. It's only come to the fore in the last 20, 30 years. So what this means is, and I, this is my own experience and with many people that I've spoken to, is there's nowhere to go. And that when the, the, the victim, and I use the word victim uh, in inverted commas, because I know what you're saying about becoming a victim, I, I get it, um, is further traumatized by the therapist who often misdiagnose the narcissist and the narcissist probably has manipulated the therapist too. <laughs> so that was also my experience. So, you know, the, 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 when you say has your, you feel maybe your work hasn't been beneficial, but to me it has been. And you are forever in my head. I can't get you out of my head. So it's been very beneficial to me. No, no, and let us, let that's, us that's why I, as I said, I wanted to do this because I thought having it straight from you, I've, you, know, you quoted quite a lot of times in the book, but I think that if we go back to the basics and we say um, there is a difference between a narcissistic traits, narcissistic style, narcissistic personality disorder, the disorder is on a spectrum. Most benign form of narcissism to malignant narcissism and then to psychopathy. So maybe you can tell us about the difference between the traits, the style and the disorder itself. First of all, we are in a period of uh, transition. There are powerful voices in academia and outside academia which dispute the very existence of narcissism as a clinical entity or a clinical construct. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the book that defines mental health for, for the rest of the world, with the exception of North America, it's known as ICD, edition 11, the 11th edition of ICD, which is International Classification of Diseases. So the ICD, for example, had eliminated this diagnosis. It actually eliminated all personality disorders and had come instead with a single personality disorder with different emphasis, which had been, which had, which is what I had been advocating since 1997. Absolutely. I, I agree. I, I don't think there should be different. I think people switch and oscillate between a variety of what today is are considered to be separate diagnoses. And I think narcissists as well gravitate and, and oscillate and vacillate between of being an overt narcissist and then suddenly <laughs> they become covert and then they go back to being overt and they're somatic one day, one day and cerebral the next. There's no type constancy. Mm -hmm. It's not type constancy because narcissists collapse. They fail. So if you're cerebral and you fail, for example, you fail to impress people with your intellectual prowess and and uh, pyrotechnic uh, intelligence, you fail mm. and you become somatic because you need supply and you don't care where you, where you get it. So you become somatic and you mm. use sex and whatever is left of your body to try to obtain supply. It's the same with overt and covert. It's, if you fail as an overt, if no one pays attention to you or, or they ridicule you when you try to, then you become covert. You become a seething, passive aggressive, envious creature. So, <laughs> We already know that there's no type constancy, and we're beginning to think that we have completely misconstrued the whole field. We believe, increasingly believe today, that what we used to call overt narcissists, the in-your-face, daring-do, 
Donald Trump type, type narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually a psychopath. <clears throat> we are beginning to, to think that it's actually a psychopath. We definitely are increasingly, we increasingly consider borderline personality disorder to be a form of psychopathy. So it all seems to kind of gravitate towards a mega concept of psychopathy. Covert narcissists, on the other hand, are compensatory. So we, we begin to, to think that narcissism is a compensatory style. At the core of the narcissist, mm -hmm. there is insecurity, if a sense of inferiority, a perception mm -hmm. of inadequacy, feeling as a bit unworthy object. And so to, to cover up for this, to compensate for this, and develop grandiose fantasies, and whether you can accomplish these fantasies or not, is immaterial, because you inhabit these fantasies. You live within the fantasy. You had renounced reality, even when you're overt. Narcissists renounce reality. Otto Kernberg was the first to suggest in 1975 that narcissism and borderline are actually forms of psychosis. And so mm. narcissists in, in mm. many ways are psychotic. Absolutely. They confuse external reality with internal reality in many ways. And so they, they live in, in fantasy land. The only thing, the only, the only problem there is that as opposed to, psych, to psychotics, they try to bring you into the fantasy. They are coercive. Psychotics are not coercive. Psychotics just confuse right. the internal with the external. But the right. narcissist, narcissist insists that you confirm and affirm that his fantasy is not a fantasy, that it's a reality. If he considers himself to be a genius, he wants you to tell him that he's a genius. And this is called narcissistic supply. And when the narcissist is frustrated, he definitely becomes aggressive. And if he's overt, he switches to psychopathy. So he becomes antisocial. Mm. Um, and so we're beginning to see a melding of all this. Now, there are powerful voices such as Judith, Judith, Judith Herman, and less powerful voices, such as Sam Vakni, who suggest that all these disorders are actually post-traumatic conditions. They are forms, they are forms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. These, these had been used to be mutilated, abused children. And they adopted a series of strategies to cope with the abuse and the trauma in early childhood. And one of these strategies is known as narcissism. So narcissism can be easily reconceived as a stunted, frozen child who yeah. is, a, is in a post-traumatic state. Yeah. And then if this is the, is the case, it's good news because we know how to treat trauma very effectively, but we don't know how to treat personality disorders at all. We fail repeatedly and consistently with most of them, if not all of them, but we do know to treat trauma. So if we just change the way we look at narcissism, maybe there's hope, maybe there's healing. My work on cold therapy is a harbinger of this, but I don't believe I'm the last word. And so it's very difficult when you talk about victims. First of all, I, I, as you know, I make a distinction between having been victimized and being a victim. Being a victim is an identity. Yes. Being a victim is yes. identity politics. Having been victimized is a fact. And so when we talk about victims, it becomes very, very fraught and problematic because if you perceive narcissists as people who are in a post-traumatic condition, then they are victims. It's just of, one, that, ab of that abuse. Yeah. So, so it's just one type of victim victimizing another type of victim. It changes the whole mental picture. It's, it's like hurt people hurt people. You know? But Sam, here, here's the thing. <clears throat> when, when I left this person, I didn't know who and what she was. I had 20 years of psychotherapy behind me, luckily, and I'd studied psychology. I'm not a professor like you, but I'd, I'd studied. So I watched, I got all, most of the psychodynamics. I saw the victim mentality. I saw the COVID aggression, the lack of responsibility. The thinking that was so odd to me, I thought there was brain damage. I honestly thought there was some because it didn't make any sense. So I left the person and then I figured out, then it led me to, you know, to narcissism. But what I realized was that, and it made me very uncomfortable in the beginning, I shared so much with her. I realized we come from the same place, which supports what you are saying. 
so much of our stuff was the same that made me think, am I a narcissist? Is this possible? <laughs> so it's like being coming from the same place, flip sides of the, of the same coin. I went one way and the, per, the other person went in a different trajectory mm -hmm. and her uh, mother and uh, aunt are narcissists and a grandmother's a narcissist. So there's the genetic component. And then there's the, the environmental, uh, the environment part as well. So, and I think getting to the victim thing that, that certainly I, when I came out of it, I was very broken. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't sleep, you know, all of those, you've heard this a lot, I'm sure from, but, but then I realized that, that I was in control of what I was going to do to keep away from the person. And I can still hear you saying no contact. If they, if you, if they send you gifts, return them unopened. If they come to your door, call the police. I can hear you saying that. So I really implemented that and I shut the person down. But so I took back control. And what I often hear from people is, um, the narcissist hypnotized me and I was powerless. And I thought that's, that's not right because each of us has the power to say no to whatever it is. And that often um, it was kind of almost like that, yeah, you know, that there was nothing that, that the victim could do. And I, and I found that to be a, a problem. Whereas I felt, well, I, I, I'm, I can, I can take back my power and the empath thing that you mentioned, and this I got from you years ago, that if I demonize narcissists, and I say they're all good, all bad, and I'm all good. It's then I'm the same. Yes, it's it's, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I realized that in my relationship with this person, was I all good, Sam? Was I? Of course I wasn't. Yeah, but I have to take responsibility for. So that's what I that's what I see is that the power is handed over to the to the narcissistic abuser, and the person is helpless, and that is the victim dynamic that you are referring to. And also the addiction, uh, the fellowship of it's called the SLAA, Sex and Diabetics Anonymous was formed, I think in about 40 years ago, it's a St. Augustine fellowship. And that's when people came to realize that there is something was made aware of that 20 years ago. So I knew that it wasn't just the first, the, the, the somatic narcissist addicting me. I also have that addiction. So it was taking two again not just the other person. I think um, we can go to the meta level and see the dynamic between the narcissist and his typical victim, because there are atypical victims, but the typical mm -hmm. victim. It's a Faustian deal. The narcissist, mm -hmm. the narcissist offers you um, a chance to experience maternal, unconditional love. And that is the love bombing and grooming phase. And so there the narcissist says, you are, he idealizes you. He says, you're perfect, you're amazing, you're the most intelligent thing, the best thing that ever happened to me. I've never come across someone like you. You're, you're changing mm. me. You're changing me. You're omnipotent. You are. Mm. So he talks to you as a mother would, as a mother would to, a, to her child. Mothers idealize their children, otherwise they wouldn't be able to suffer them. <laughs> children are insufferable unless you idealize them. So mothers, <laughs> nature endowed mothers with the ability yeah. to overlook, to overlook the, um, the nuisance that children are and to idealize them. The narcissist does the same to you. He idealizes you. <laughs> by, by idealizing you, by idealizing you, the narcissist idealizes himself. So it's core idealization. But you experience it as unconditional maternal love, which all, that's the elixir of life. That's the holy grail. That's what we all seek in all our relationships. The and mother then, bond with the child. Sorry yes. to interrupt. The mother yes. bond with the child. It's a second chance. It's a second chance because the vast majority mm. of us grow up with mothers who are less than, less than perfect. Not good enough mothers. Mothers who are absent, who are selfish, who are tired, who are angry. Who are, we all have this, this baggage of not good enough mothering. And here's the nurse. Here the nurse comes and says, I'm going to give you a childhood back and this time it's going to work. This time it's going to be perfect. And mm. now, now I'm going to be your mother and I'm going to love you unconditionally. I'm going to idealize you. And moreover, I'm going to give you, grant you access 
to your own idealized image in my eyes, through my gaze. So you can see yourself idealized through the narcissist's gaze. That's extremely addictive because it's the first time you experience unadulterated self-love. Narcissist, the narcissist's gift to you is the ability to self-love, but an idea, a false self. The narcissist creates for you an impromptu false self, a small false self, and tells you, mm. you can fall in love with this false self of yours. I'm granting mm. you access to this false self of yours. And you can finally self-love safely in my ambit, because I'm your mother mm. and I love you unconditionally. Mm. And then what happens, once he got you addicted, he withdraws. He simply withdraws. He insists then that you do the same for him. He wants you to, to serve as a mother figure. And by the way, this is regardless of gender. It's a, it's a universal yeah. He mm -hmm. wants you then to mother him. <clears throat> but then, of course, if you mother him and he mothers you, a concept which I call dual mothership, and if he gives you access to this hall of mirrors where you see multiple reflections of your idealized self and you fall in love with these reflections, you get addicted to them, then he has infinite power over you. He has infinite. He can withdraw your self-love by, by denying you access to this hall of mirrors, mm -hmm. by blocking this idealized self. And he can become a bed mother. He can withdraw his maternal, unconditional love and acceptance which would be excruciatingly painful. So he strikes a deal with you. You're going to suspend yourself. You're going to kill yourself mentally. You're going to die. And on this condition that you agree to die mentally, he will guarantee you access to all these goodies. And, and the vast majority of people accept the deal. They die. And they become an internal object. They become what we call in psychology an introject. They are the narcissist takes a snapshot of you, photoshops the snapshot. That's the process of idealization, and then proceeds to interact with the snapshot. Why? Because the snapshot is safe. The snapshot will never abandon the narcissist. Will never challenge, yeah. disagree, yeah. criticize, whatever. That in <coughs> other words, the snapshot provides total control. But you. Your part of the deal is to never deviate from the snapshot. But how can you never deviate from the snapshot if you cease <laughs> to exist? <laughs> to never deviate, to never deviate from a static representation of you, you must become static. You must die, in effect. So when you when you begin to show signs of independence, autonomy, agency, self-efficacy when you make decisions, when you have new friends, when you travel, when you study, you are threatening the snapshot and you are breaching the contract with the narcissist because you gradually diverge from the snapshot. And so the narcissist regards you as, an, as a threat to the internal balance in his mind. You, you become a threat, you become a persecutory object. In short, you become an enemy. Hence, hence the devaluation and discard phase. Yeah. This is this is the relationship with the narcissist in a nutshell. Now, one more comment, and I will let you go. <laughs> um, I tend to hog the limelight, of course. So, <laughs> well, it's fascinating. So it's not, it's not a problem, Sam. It's fascinating. Uh, really one, fascinating. One more thing. You mentioned hypnosis or being hypnotized. Or people reporting this. Actually, yeah, yeah. Actually, they have a point. Ironically, <clears throat> or, or paradoxically, they do have a point. There is, there have been recent discoveries in neuroscience about a phenomenon called entraining. This is a phenomenon studied over the last 15 years or 20, but had come to the forefront in the last 10 years. And we discovered, for example, that using music, we can create in your brain a replica of my brain. So when two people, right. listen, when two people play the same music, their brains become utterly synchronized. And when I say utterly synchronized, the EEGs are indistinguishable. You can't tell whose brain is it. They become one brain. Now, the narcissist is used to this because of narcissistic supply. What the narcissist does, he takes your input, his input, her input, and he creates his mind. He recreates his mind on the fly. He uses this constant input. 
to recreate his mind, and I call it the hive mind, the swarm mind. Yeah. It's a kaleidoscope, it's a, it's a, it's a collage. So the narcissist is used <clears throat> to the environment having a determining effect on his mind. His mind is formed and shaped by the environment on the fly. So he's used to that. So what he does, he entrains you. He actually replicates his mind in yours, literally. Literally, he synchronizes the brain waves through entrainment. But then the question is, how does he do it? You don't, not all, not all couples play music together. So how, how does he succeed to do that? Well, there is a form of music that the narcissist uses to accomplish this. It's called verbal abuse. Verbal abuse has all the characteristics of music. It has repetitive refrains. It has right. cadence. It has cadence. It has tempo. It has rhythm. It has harmony. It has melody. Verbal abuse is music. It's exactly like rap, rap hip hop. It's music. It's a musical style. I can actually take a verbal abuse session, put it online, and people will think it's music. So he uses verbal abuse to entrain you, to create in your mind, literally and physically, physiologically, a replica of the brainwaves in his mind. In this sense, it's very close to dissociative suggestive states, such as hypnosis. Now, the reason I agree with you that it doesn't, it doesn't justify victim passivity is mm -hmm. that entrain, entraining, entraining takes place only during the abusive session. Once the session is over, you are de-entrained. You're no longer entrained. So then mm -hmm. you regain, you regain self-control, autonomy, and you can make decisions. But during this intermittent reinforcement bullying session, you are, ac you are actually um, passive and with, without uh, almost any control. And in this sense, you're hypnotized during this period. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Sam, if we go back to um, the difference between narcissistic traits, style, and, and what's currently called the disorder, so the first, the, two, the first to suggest the first to suggest that there's a difference was a guy called Lin, uh, Lynn Sperry, and he suggested that sh there should be a distinction between, between people who have narcissistic style, also known as assholes, and people who have mm. narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. Then Millen Theodore Millen came into the scene, adopted Lynn Sperry's work. He cites Lynn Sperry in his seminal uh, book, uh, Personality Disorders in Modern Life. And so he adopted his work and he added another layer, the narcissistic personality. So now we have three layers. We have style, personality, and disorder. And the difference, is, difference between them is quantitative, literally, but quantity to the point that it becomes quality. So for example, traits would be exaggerated. Lack of empathy would be more extreme. Behaviors mm -hmm. would be escalated. Uh, exploitation would be emphasized. Envy would be much stronger in, in the disorder. Antisocial behaviors are almost exclusive to the disorder, etc. So it's a, it's a matter of quantity. It's an exagger it's, these are exaggerated forms of each other. The disorder, though, when you cross <coughs> into the disorder, you are beginning to have several psychological and psychodynamic features which are absent from the style and from the personality. For example, you are no longer able to relate to other people as external. What you tend to do as a narcissist with a disorder, you tend to internalize other people. You tend to create internal objects represent, which represent these people. And then you regard other people as figments of your mind, as extensions which explains a lot of the abuse and a lot of, uh, because you, it's, uh, if he abuses, if I abuse you as a narcissist, it's self-inflicted because you're not there. You're in my mind. You're an internal object. Mm. So I subject you to all the dynamics in my mind because you are a part of my mind. For example, my mother taught me to not have boundaries. I abuse means when the parent, parental figures or caregivers 
breach the child's boundaries. Don't allow the child yeah. to separate. Okay. So I am used to not having boundaries. But because you are part of my mind, I have no problem to breach your boundaries. I do to you that which was done to me. Because you are me. You are me. That is something victims can, can't wrap the, the, their heads around. I mean, so, so, and that's one example of, of, of a psychodynamic feature or psychological feature which clearly distinguishes uh, not, uh, the disorder from all. I would say that perhaps the second thing, with your permission, perhaps the second thing is where a lack of empathy crosses into sadism, antisocial behavior, um, the tendency to abuse in a way which is negating and vitiating of the victim. And that's why I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse to distinguish it from other types of abuse. Other types of abuse leverage some dimensions of your existence, financial abuse, legal abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, you name it, all of them leverage some aspect of you. Sexual abuse leverages usually your genitalia, you know? So it's a limited type of abuse. Narcissistic abuse is all pervasive, ubiquitous, and above all, the main goal and the only goal of narcissistic abuse is for you to cease to exist because your separateness constitutes a threat. And narcissists are not equipped to deal with separateness. They were never allowed to separate. So this is where this is where a lack of empathy in the disorder becomes extreme. I mean, <clears throat> I think that the word narcissist and narcissism, that it, it's used very freely today. And I think I got this from you as well, that adolescence, for example, is a naturally narcissistic phase where the child is individuating, okay. uh, becomes God and saying to, my, it's saying to parents, uh, off you go. I'm, I'm becoming my own person. So it is healthy. Uh, without some modicum of narcissism, we're not going to survive. Of course. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I've always thought of it the way I see it is, it's exactly what you're saying, that really what distinguishes the, the disorder from traits or style is that lack of emotional empathy. There is cognitive, as you've called it, cold empathy and interpersonal exploitation. Um, and if we, you've now, you know, we've spoken about narcissistic abuse, but so we have really four phases, which are not linear. So we have idealization, as you said, discard, sorry, devaluation, discard, and then the hoover. So do you want to take us through, through those, those phases, sir? Seeing as you can say it so much better than I can. <laughs> Hoovering is another term that I coined, by the way. <laughs> was that yours as well? I, yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> people people don't, don't realize it, but it's another term. I coined. Um, <clears throat> Before I go there, you see the language breaks down. Even for someone like you who is well-versed in narcissism, the language breaks down because you use the term exploitation. Narcissists never exploit. I can't exploit you, you don't exist. You're part of me. Who am I exploiting? <laughs> from, right, so from- I'm taking uh, what's mine, my... I'm taking what's mine. I mean- Right, so from my sent... perspective, yeah. yeah, not yeah. from a narcissist perspective. Yeah. I get that. I didn't see that a few years ago, but now I do. It, yes. it breaks it breaks the mind i mean it's my mind yeah. boggling. it's the yeah. mind can't function anymore because it's so alien narcissists are so alien in the way they yeah. perceive others or don't perceive others <laughs> that's a, the core problem by the way narcissists have no what we call object relations the narcissist is stuck in a phase of development called self-relation but he doesn't progress to object relation object relation simply means relating to others and as a joke, it's very telling that in psychology, the word object means people, just for your information. So right. <laughs> object relations means relations with people. Yeah. Yes, yes. So psychology is very, very narcissistic field because if I regard it yeah, as a funny, object, you, yeah. It's funny you should say that. I was just thinking that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to, to, <clears> your, to your question, when, which you asked when we were both a lot younger about uh, idealization and, and so on and so forth. As I said, there's no, there's no, I've modified the concept of ideal, idealization and now it should be called co-idealization because the narcissist, by idealizing you, idealizes himself. If you are the most intelligent person on earth, 
and I'm with you, it says something about me. If you're, yeah. if if someone is the, if if someone is the most beautiful woman on earth and she chooses me or she is with me, it says something about me. So there's no there's no separate idealization. It's always core idealization. And actually, the main reason for idealization is the narcissist part. The narcissist wants to aggrandize and idealize himself. And the only way to do this is to aggrandize and idealize everyone around him. And that's why he does that. That's the first motivation. Second motivation, when I idealize you, it's irresistible to you. Because as I said, it's a form of maternal unconditional love and so on. But also who doesn't want to be thought of as super intelligent, amazingly beautiful and so on. It's irresistible, it's addictive. So mm. I, the, one of the, the second main function of co-idealization is to get the victim or the prey or the target or the inter potential intimate partner addicted. So it creates addiction. Idealization lasts for as long as you don't diverge or deviate from the snapshot, from the introject. Because in the process of idealization, the narcissist creates an image of you, which is photoshopped. That's idealization. And then as long as you don't deviate or diverge from this image, everything is okay and you will continue <coughs> to be idealized. As long as we behave. <laughs> as long as you're dead. Let's, right. let's call a spade right. a spade, as long as you're dead. Right, right. Because if I tell you, let's eat in this restaurant and you say, no, let's eat in that restaurant, you had diverged mm -hmm. from the snapshot. You had disagreed with me. It also implies some form of criticism. Your choice of restaurant is wrong. It also implies that yeah. you know something, implies that you know something that I don't know. So you're challenging right. my omniscience. Right. It's, if you tell me, listen, let me help you. It's, I don't interpret it as an indication or expression of love. I interpret it as an attempt to humiliate me, to imply yeah. that I'm not omnipotent, that I need yeah. you, that you have something I don't have. So even the most innocuous comments, most loving or, will be perceived mm. as challenging or undermining the snapshot. You can't do anything right. Whatever you do will be perceived as an attempt to unsettle the precarious balance of the narcissist's inner universe, and therefore will render you a persecutory object, an enemy. In other words, in other words, devaluation is inevitable the, as long as you show signs of life. It's inevitable. The victims should stop asking themselves, what did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? Should I have done this? Should I have done that? Should I not have said this? Should I? You would have been devalued, period. If you, if you eat and drink and breathe, it's sufficient for the narcissist to, to switch to the devaluation mode. The only way for you to have avoided devaluation is to have rendered yourself an ancient Egyptian mummy, about as lively and as attractive. So, it's in common. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the narcissist also suffers from extreme separation insecurity, also known colloquially as abandonment anxiety. Mm. So the moment you show a sign of independence and autonomy, any, the slightest, a new friend, going out for coffee, you, doing something without the narcissist or without his permission, anything, using the smartphone. I mean, any, because when you're with your smartphone, you have a private enclave, a private world. It's very threatening. Mm. Anything you do would provoke devaluation. Now, why did the narcissist need to devalue you? because you're a source of threat and because you are proof positive that his judgment had been wrong. I mean, he, if he needs to devalue you, then he judged you wrongly, didn't he? So he needs to eliminate you. And he eliminates you by, by claiming that you had changed this new information, you had changed somehow, or he found out new things about you, or you went crazy, or you became insufferable, or something, there's been a transformation in you that does not vitiate, does not negate his initial judgment of you. You had changed, not the narcissist. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, now that you have changed, he can create 
a negative introjective view. He can create the opposite of the yeah. snapshot. He can create a snapshot that is ugly, that is stupid, that is, and then this justifies discarding you. And that's uh, the last phase. He needs to discard you because your very existence is a threat. And this is what people fail to understand. Narcissistic abuse is not about something you do or something you don't do or choices or decisions or lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Narcissistic abuse is about getting rid of your existence, killing you, in effect, if possible, physically, but usually mentally, killing you. Then the discard. Following the discard, you actually, there's another phase, which is replacement. The narcissist tries to find an alternative to you and go through the whole process again. The narcissist creates something called shared fantasy. Shared fantasy was first described by Sanger in 1989, not by Wagner. <laughs> and the shared fantasy is a, is a fantastic space where the narcissist can maintain his grandiosity and where he can exert full control over you and negate your agency. So that's the shared fantasy. Shared fantasy also includes fantastic elements like dreams, aspirations, um, a, a, a brilliant rosy future. It could be children, could be family, it could be money, it could be whatever. But So that's the shared fantasy. He drags you into the shared fantasy. And uh, the replacement is simply finding another partner for the shared fantasy. If he fails at the replacement phase, then he switches to phase 4B. Four, four and 4B would be hoovering. The hoovering is a last resort, actually. People think that narcissists hoover habitually. They try to avoid it as much as they can. It's a last resort. It's indicative of the narcissist's failure to find a replacement for you. But there is one case where the narcissist will never ever hoover you. And that's if you had mortified the narcissist. In 1957, a group of scholars described the phenomenon <coughs> in the study of narcissism known as narcissistic mortification. Mm. Narcissistic mortification is when someone, an intimate partner, or shames you and humiliates you in public in front of people you care for, people whose opinions you value. So if I were to create a situation where you are, for example, sitting with your colleagues or with your peers, and then I were to shame you and humiliate you horribly in front of all of them, I will have mortified you. And then narcissists never hover after mortification. Mortification is a fascinating process because what happens is the false self and all the defenses break down, they're inactivated. And the narcissist is faced with his own internal void known as the empty schizoid core. The narcissist is faced with a black hole at his, at his own center. And that's, of course, a harrowing, traumatizing experience. So he will never come near you again. You have the capacity to traumatize him. Is that the same as narcissistic decompensation, Sam? Decompensation is an element in motivation. <coughs> decompensation it's simply means, yes, decompensation is a clinical term for, for when defense mechanisms, psychological defense mechanisms, are disabled. Mm. Are disabled so then they're no longer able to filter and reframe reality in a way which will conform to the narcissist's self-image so his mm. self-image is assaulted and assailed by numerous countervailing data from reality and he can't stand that and his false self mm. falls apart borderlines by the way go through the compensation as well the disabling of of these defenses creates a very interesting phenomenon um, and that's that's the crux of my work nowadays, and and it's be it's becoming widely accepted in academia. I just gave lectures in McGill University about this, and I'm going to give lectures in Cambridge and so on. I suggested that actually we should consider all personality disorders as an assemblage of self states. So people with personality disorders don't have a, don't have a single self. They have multiple self-states. Mm. And then what mm. happens is, under stress, under duress, under humiliation, rejection, abandonment, etc., etc., <coughs> or when challenged and undermined, for example, by your independent behavior, people with personality disorders switch between self-states. So, for example, the borderline, mm. borderline, if she perceives rejection and abandonment, 
which is her greatest fear. If she perceives them, then she decompensates, her defense mechanisms switch off. Mm. And she switches from one self-state, the borderline self-state, to a psychopathic self-state. She becomes a psychopath, uh, more precisely mm. a secondary psychopath. Yeah. So the self-state's argument or the self-state's mo model is a fascinating model, in effect. Because first of all, it allows us to unify all personality disorders. We just say, okay, there is a, a limited set, set of self-states. Mm. And... These apply to borderline, these apply to narcissism, and also it means that when the narcissist switches to another self-state, it can easily become covert or a borderline. Or he could become a psychopath, or a psychopath can become a narcissist, or he can become a borderline. I mean, it, it opens up the, the field. It, it allows for all these transitions that had been observed in therapy and in clinical settings, but were not accounted for by the DSM and other categorical texts. So it's much more fluid. You know, getting back to the Hoover, Sam, <clears throat> the last time I spoke, I'd never received a Hoover before. And um, I got one, I think, uh, a year and a half after I left the relationship. And it was the most bizarre, disturbing experience. And I think um, it's really important for, for, for people to hear is that as the person just arrived at my house, I firstly was very nervous. And secondly, I felt as if there were walls of steel around me. And I kept having to remind myself of who and what was in front of me. And all the charm was switched on, you know. It, and right at the end, I saw a reptilian intelligence there, a sly intelligence. And I thought of a, a black mamba striking a mouse or a king cobra striking a mouse, which is very primal. And the, the snake doesn't do it because there's anything wrong with the snake. That is the design of the snake. There's no empathy for that poor mouse that's going to suffer. And that's what I felt right at the end. It, it, was, it was this sly intelligence and she knew exactly what she was doing. That was the other thing that horrified me. And, you know, when, when people experience the Hoover, it's very hard to resist from, from my perspective because I love the person and because it looked, it was a fantastic show, but I hadn't experienced it the last time we spoke and now I have. And all I can say is it was difficult to resist, but I'm very glad that I did. I did not allow myself to be drawn back in. And I think that's very important that people can be, you know. And also I was thinking that when I left the person, I joined a a group of for narcissistic abuse survivors and the person that I started speaking to um, he had to plan his exit over a year he planned it because he was married they shared money etc I didn't do that I could just leave this person I just packed up and I left I didn't know who she was I just left but but he had to plan it and you've said this before many times Sam it's very hard to leave yeah. it's very hard to leave Covering involves two, two mechanisms. One is triggering. The very presence of the, of the narcissist triggers you. Uh, you, <coughs> had been, you had been traumatized by the narcissist on the one hand, so it triggers a trauma. Mm. But it also triggers the good memories. It's not only the bad yeah. memories. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. triggering of the entire panoply of memories and emotions that are involved <coughs> in the relationship. And by the way, that is common for healthy relationships. I mean, if you were to divorce, yes. perfectly healthy person, and she would, you would, she would see her again, you would be triggered, you would be. But in the case yeah. of the narcissist, in the case of the narcissist, the triggering uh, disables you because it also triggers the trauma. So you have a post-traumatic response, you know, freeze, freeze, fight, fight, flight, form, all this. Mm. So you have all this panoply, post-traumatic responses. This is the trigger. And the second thing that hovering does, it entices you it entices you because you see what happens typical, with typical victims of narcissists, what happens is a process called merger and fusion. Merger and fusion when you either willingly surrender your boundaries or you never had boundaries to start with. You're codependent, for example. Yeah. yeah. And so you merge, you become one organism <clears throat> with a narcissist. You become a single unit, uh, a, a, a cerebrus with two heads, you know. 
Uh, and so, uh, when the narcissist abandons you, you abandon the narcissist, it's the equivalent of an amputation. And you have a phantom limb left behind. It's yeah. like I, I would amputate yeah. your leg, but you would still feel your leg. Yeah. Yeah. You'd still feel the narcissist there. There's a phantom narcissist left behind yeah. because you were one, you were a single entity. Mm. And leaving the narcissist made you half. And you will always be half without her. She will always be there as a phantom. She will be there more clinically as an introject. She is in your mind. She's in your head. She talks to you. Even if you don't realize it, even if you are not aware, she is there. She had penetrated. She had mind snatched you and then body snatched you. And she had merged with you. It's like the alien movies when the alien enters a body. You know, and then from the outside, it looks like Sam Vaknin, but actually it's an alien from, <laughs> you know. So, so hovering... Hoovering seems to be like a, this kind of trivial, trivial pursuit, if you wish. You know, someone, yeah. an ex, tries to pick you up. No way. It's an exceedingly complex psychodynamic uh, or psychological process. Exceedingly. It involves multiple disciplines in psychology. It's, it's one of the most understudied and amazing phenomena in psychology. <clears throat> and you as a codependent or you as someone with poor boundaries or you as a boundary person who has surrendered your boundaries or you who had struck the Faustian mm. deal yeah give me a second chance and in return i will kill myself for a while or suspend myself for a while if you had done any of this and you had because you had a relationship with the narcissist if you had done any of this you would be sorely tempted and here's another reason it's much easier to be dead than to be alive it's anxiety reducing. We all live in a state of anxiety. And anxiety yeah. is provoked by life. But when you suspend your existence, when you're no longer alive, there is a sense of calm. I know it sounds bizarre because victims are always traumatized and they're anxious and they're depressed on the one hand. Mm. But on the other hand, handing control to the narcissist has, has merits. In, in terms of being, feeling safe, feeling in a way that you're in good hands. So this is, this is the dynamic that works with dictators. Dictators like Ad Adolf Hitler, you know. His message was, let me manage everything. Don't worry. You have no responsibility and no accountability. I become the external locus of control. And that leads us yeah. to the concept. This leads us to the concept of external locus of control. In a relationship with the narcissist, your life is controlled from the outside. You have an external locus. And so you are never to blame. You're never guilty. You're never responsible. You're never accountable. As long as you play the game with the narcissist. As long as you conform. I remember all those feelings, Sam. Exactly what you're describing. <clears throat> there was a great sense of safety and peace in being with the person i i i, I get you completely you know maybe another concept Same, uh, to, another concept mm. to in, in, inject here uh, would be the comfort zone <clears throat> people who end up with narcissists usually default to a comfort zone and this comfort zone reflects mm. something in childhood so maybe they were not allowed to separate in childhood and to become individuals mm. the parent emotionally blackmailed them or there was emotional ambient incest or i don't know what and they couldn't separate and individuate so here's an opportunity to again not separate so this is a comfort zone maybe they've been abused as children and so they gravitate to the narcissist because because she is an abuser i mean that's the job qualification she's an abuser and so you need to recreate the comfort zone of having been abused now what is a comfort zone comfort zone is not positive or negative actually most comfort zones are negative Comfort zone is simply a way of existence where you feel that you know the rules, you know the ropes, everything is predictable, and you can control the process. Yeah. That's a comfort zone. Now, we have studies that show that women who had been abused, battered, beaten up in childhood by, for example, fa their fathers, tend overwhelmingly to select uh, abusers as partners. 
because they know how to cope with an abuser. They know how to predict his reactions. Yeah. It's familiar. You know, Sam, I, in the book, in my book, I describe being with somebody who did not, does not exist. All that existed was a mask that, that uh, 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 danced and gleamed with portrayals of authenticity, kindness, and personality. And I got that from you because you said that there is actually nobody there. Yes. And so when I, when I think about her now, I think um, I shared so many special moments. We traveled to a lot of countries and so on. But there was nothing from her side. And I think that's a difficulty for, for, for us, as I, I call myself a survivor of narcissistic abuse. And you actually said this in one of your lectures in London, I think, with Richard. You said the most difficult thing for you to understand is that none of you are special to us. That's what you said, I remember. Most oh. difficult thing. Yeah. yeah. That, that in her mind, I, I'm, I'm a, the, a, just a different make of toaster or a different make of car or a different make of cell phone. There's nothing special about me at all to, to her. You're, in, you're interchangeable, yes. The interchangeable units. That, those were the, the terms that yes. you used. Um, and I think also, Sam, that in the beginning, and we did touch on this a little bit earlier, is that I would say, if I was this person, I wouldn't have behaved in that way. And then I realized that was a fatal error. I had to look at it from the perspective of the narcissist. And you were talking about the, the breakdown of language earlier. Adolf Hitler thought that what he was doing was right. So that's his perspective. In my perspective, you shouldn't go and kill people like that. But that's his perspective. I've just been busy reading a book about Jonestown, about Jim Jones, and listening to how he killed all those people. From his perspective, yeah, he was what he was them. doing was okay. Was okay. He was saving. Them. He was saving. So, yeah. So I think if we if if we look at it from if I look at it from my perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But if I look at it from the perspective of the narcissist, it makes complete sense. Who's right and who's wrong? Maybe it isn't a question of that. It's a question of what's okay for me and what's not okay for me as, as, as each person, yeah? It is definitely wrong to convert the discourse on narcissism to a morality play. Good versus evil. Yes. Good yes. versus evil, right versus wrong. <laughs> yes. It's, it's very wrong and it's, it leads, leads people astray because they become angels and the, the narcissist is a devil and, you know, it's, it becomes highly religious. And, do you, and it's do you think I'm an angel? Yeah, do you think I'm an angel, Sam? Do I look like an angel? Of course you're not an angel. No one is. No one is. And, exactly. Um, exactly. and it's not about being the devil. Remember the simple principle. The narcissist yeah. knows no better. He wants to do to you what had been done to him because he considers yeah. himself. Because yeah. he considers himself su superior. He wants to elevate yeah. you to his level. I'm doing you a favor to be in my company, to share my life yeah. with me, to make love to me, it's enormous privilege because I'm yeah. a unique being. I'm a superior, I'm a light being, you know, I'm a superior creature. And I want to do to you what had been done to me because that way you will become me. And by yeah. and I'm elevating you to my level. When I'm making you me, when I'm making you a clone of me, a replica of me, I'm doing you a favor and a once in a lifetime favor. Now, what had been done to me? First of all, I was not about to separate. So not, I will not allow you to separate. I will not allow you to make this horrible mistake of becoming an individual. <laughs> Second thing, I was hollowed out. I was hollowed out. I was rendered into an, a void, an emptiness. It's called the empty schizoid core in clinical terms. I became an emptiness. But I don't consider this a disadvantage. I consider this the next step in the evolutionary ladder. This is what renders me superior. <clears throat> and so I want to empty you. I want to hollow you out also. Because I want to bring yeah. you to, I want to bring you to the tribe. I want you to share my superiority. I love you. I, this is love, isn't it? Love is about elevating the partner, allowing the partner to grow and to develop. So this is self-development. This is self-growth, what I'm doing to you. 
So I'm empty, you should be empty. I have no boundaries, you should have no boundaries. I've been, I've been abused. I will abuse you because abuse had been proven to be a methodology which had led to superiority. I call mm. it, I will call it probably tough love or something, you know? So this is what people, the narcissist intentions, and that's the irony. The narcissist, first of all, is selfless. He has no self, <laughs> literally has no self. That's why he needs input from the outside. He has no functioning self. That's one thing. And the second thing is the narcissist is well-intentioned, not evil. That's the psychopath. The psychopath is evil. The narcissist yeah. is well-intentioned. He believes, he believes that together you can become this amazing single unit that is by definition far more advanced than the rest of humanity. But unfortunately, you are not at this step of evolution. He needs to bring you up to him. Right. And that's, that's a good summary of relationships with the narcissist. They try to educate you, edify you, improve you, change you, transform you, help you. I mean, they try all the time to make you who you are not, to take away your identity because it sucks your identity. Better to adopt the narcissist. You know, it's, it's easy for me to, to hear all of this now, Sam, <clears throat> but not in the beginning of my journey. So in the beginning, I hated the person and I hated what I'd become, a shell of my former self. And only, you know, a long time, many years later, can I discuss it like this with you because there's distance from it now. But the people, uh, I started speaking to so many people about it, some of my clients, I mean, my travel agent planned her own suicide. Um, uh, an old friend of mine goes into a, a clinic for depression once a year because her husband is a narcissist. So from our side, it's, it's so inconceivable in the beginning. I think, well, because I have emotional empathy that everyone else is going to have it. I didn't realize that some people just don't have it. So it's very difficult for us to understand and achieve distance, to say, I understand how the narcissist works, but it really destroys us. It's, it's so dangerous for us. I mean, an, an, an ex-girlfriend of mine from 30 years ago was married to a psychopath. And she said to me recently that she had planned. Oops, you froze the Charles. I don't know if you can hear me. Sam, are you there? Yes, I can yes. hear you now. You froze. You said a friend of mine had planned and then you vanished. <laughs> yeah. So uh, she was married to a psychopath for, I think, uh, maybe about 10 years. And then she was so unhappy that she had asked somebody to, uh, to kill her, take mm. a hit out on her. So what I'm, I mean, you, you know this better than I do, Sam, the damage that, 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 that it does. So that's the only reason I can speak about it now with a sense of humor and, and more distant, you know. What what would you say to people who who are in a relationship with a narcissist? Don't what be. would your advice be? Sam? Don't be right. <laughs> Honestly, all the rest is bullshit. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of bullshit on that. Do this, do that. I invented most of this bullshit, by the way. I came up with mirroring and with the, you name it. <laughs> I yeah. came up with with seven of eight techniques. The only technique I did not come up with is gray rock. So gray rock is not my invention, but all the rest, <coughs> what you hear about, I mean, it's, I invented it. And yet I'm telling you, they're all bullshit. The, the only viable uh, solution, save your life, get away, no contact. And no contact means no contact, no texts, no social media stalking, yeah. no, no gifts, no third party introductions, no flying monkey, not, none. No contact, no attempts because the brain, the brain plays tricks on you. It would come up with a million reasons why yes to be in contact only once for a few minutes. It's just once for a few minutes. And there's excellent reason for it. There's an excellent reason. And one of the main, of course, alibis is having common children or common property. Yeah. Or it's my mother. How could I give up on her? Or it's my child. It's my son. How can I give up on him? You know? These are all excuses. And I don't yeah. have money. I don't have money. It's an excuse. You don't have money. It's an excuse. 
You have common children, it's an excuse. It's your mother, it's an excuse. They're all excuses. Now, of course, some departures are much more complex than others, but departure is, it must be one way or another. You have common children, let your attorneys communicate. He has to pick them up, don't be there. Ask your cousin to be there. If there is visitation, make them supervised, or ask someone to be there. I mean, find a solution, not contact. He wants to talk to you, he cannot talk to you. You have a lawyer, or you have a neighbor, I don't know. Or you have a good friend. It's your mother, walk away. She is your enemy. She threatens your life. Walk away. <laughs> Why do people but, why do people not consider narcissists as, as life threatening? They are. It's not that narcissists are, are life threatening because of their practices. Narcissists are life threatening because it's you or, or them. It's if you're alive, the narcissist's life is threatened, at least mental life. Yeah. If he's alive, he needs you to be dead. He will offer you a lot for this. I mean, it's a bargain. <laughs> it's a bargain death. He will offer you a lot to stop to exist. But he needs you to stop to exist. It's you or him. You or her. The final invoice, and I think I got this from you too, Sam. The final invoice is for our life. That's you. That's in my book too. The final invoice from the narcissist is for our life, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my own no contact has been in place ever since I discovered who and what she was completely blocked never looked for her on facebook i speak to nobody who you know just completely no contact and that's the because sam apart from the risk of of of, of getting back together again i would like to believe i'm strong enough now um it's also like um as an alcoholic having one drink it's not okay it's the same principle yeah. and the other thing sam if i talk to my abuser, I'm giving the signal to myself that what the person did is okay. And it's not okay. It's the same as if I come to your house and you open the door, you please to see me and I start punching you. What are you gonna do? Hit me back, close the door. That's what you should do, right? So the message is if I talk, if I'm in contact with my abuser, I'm saying to me, it's not okay. And, and you know, the other thing, Sam, when I, when I left the person, I thought I got the better of her, but I didn't. I got the better of myself. That's what I did. I beat myself because that's, that was the war, which is, which is what you've been speaking about is that, that, that battle to leave, you know what I mean? The, the, the difficulty in leaving. So Sam, is there anything, any other advice? I, I mean, yeah. just before you answer, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying it probably for the third time, but people that I know, whether they're clients, friends, etc., the majority of them do not leave. I know I did, and I know that this friend of mine, he left, the one who planned his exit over a year. It, is, is that in your experience too, that most people don't leave? They not, not only do not leave, but they re-victimize. They, they keep selecting mates, <laughs> which are replicas of the of the of the narcissist right right so we have like serial serial victim victimhood or serial yeah. you know yeah. the, this, my third husband were, were is as narcissistic as my second husband who was even worse than my first husband and why you why, why do you keep choosing these people you know but it's conditioning we know childhood conditioning and so on yes there was one more piece of advice yes the narcissist is a wily wily animal uh, enemy he picks up on your body language. He picks up on your facial micro expressions. Yeah. He, pick, he picks up on words you say, but much more importantly, he picks up on words that you do not say. Anything can and will be used against you in due time. Confidences you shared, emotions witnessed, facial expressions, hunched, a hunched shoulder, a twitching leg, a, a tick, anything and everything is catalogued 
observed, cataloged for future use yeah. and future abuse. That's the main reason for no contact. Because every minute you spend with the narcissist is providing is equivalent to providing the narcissist with ammunition for a future battle. You are giving ammunition to your enemy. And he is going to use it. Don't kid yourself. It's like yeah. the United States equipped the Mujahideen at the time. It came back to, to bite them in the ass at 9-11. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You are giving weapons to your enemy. And trust me, uh, I'm, I happen to be a narcissist. Had I decided to victimize you, had, had you been in my crosshairs, in this session alone, <clears throat> I have enough ammunition to ruin you for good. For good, and I mean for good. To render you utterly discombobulating, psychotic in a mental world for the rest of your life. And that's in 45 minutes. Now, I happen to be a super intelligent narcissist. This is the most dangerous kind. I'm also a psychopathic narcissist. But even a run-of-the-mill pedestrian narcissist would do a, a job 50% as, as good as mine. That's... <laughs> also exceedingly dangerous. And, and, and I'd like to add to that, Sam, that the person that I was with was not bright. Yeah. But boy, boy, was she good at what she did. Yeah, exactly. I, I, with, 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 with my background in psychology and being in therapy, I, I, I thought I was losing my mind. Most tigers. I thought I was losing. I heard that most tigers <clears throat> score, score very low on IQ tests. I heard so. But you wouldn't take the risk, mm. would you, with a tiger? Narcissists, no. are, op na narcissists are optimized, optimized predatory systems. The H word counts here. Optimize predatory, yeah. predatory systems. They're not a human being. They're a hive mind. They're a, a collage of hundreds of minds. It's, it's uh, like a colony. Narcissus, the narcissist is like a colony. Yeah. It's like a killer bee colony. You know? And you're feeding it with information. Things you say, things you don't say, body language, this, that. You're feeding it with yeah. information. And it's coming at you. Make no mistake. It's coming at you. And it's going to devour you and leave nothing, be nothing behind. You. And it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's, it has to do with reflexes and instincts. It's primordial, it's primeval, it's primitive. It's not on the level of uh, Nietzsche and, and Schopenhauer and Hegel, you know? It's tooth and claw. It's nail, it's nail and claw and tooth. It's red in nail and toe and cloth. It's, it's nature. It's a predator. It, it's, in, it's interesting, Sam, because I've watched a lot of documentaries on black mambas. <clears throat> and the black mamba is obviously extremely venomous. But it is also highly unpredictable. It's a very skittish, defensive snake. So when I watch snake handlers swim with king cobras, which are also very deadly, they're fine. But when you watch a snake handler dealing with a black mamba, they sweat because they know that this attack can come out of nowhere. Now, that's not the fault of the black mamba. That is the design. <laughs> and if we look at uh, Maslow's hierarchical theory of needs, that's right down at the bottom. That snake, that black mamba is not self-actualizing. That's what it's designed to do. And I see that the same way with, with the narcissist, that it's a primal, it's a very primal level. And with the black mamba, the only thing to do, it comes into your no contact, is to keep away from them. Yeah. Keep away from them, because they're dangerous. I'll it's give you the fault one, of the snake. I'll give you one concluding yes. line. Yes. Narcissists are predators who feed on other people's autonomy other people's separateness hold on for a second right. I open the door yeah i'm sorry i had to open the no door problem. yeah Apologies. no problem so narcissists are, are, narcissists suck other people's autonomy, other people's separateness. Mm. The, I think that's the main feeding mechanism of, of narcissists. Mm. 
they they are kind of supernatural being, if you wish, animals that go around and when they see that you're autonomous and separate, they suck it out of you. And narcissists are very good at creating crowds and mobs and masses mm -hmm. throughout history. The great leaders of of mobs and crowds, or clocracies, yes, ruled by mob, mob rule, were narcissists, of course. Adolf Hitler comes to mind, and much less malevolent and pernicious, Donald Trump. These are narcissists. What they do is they suck the autonomy and separateness of people and render them into a mass, indistinguishable mass. That's what the narcissist does to you. It renders you protoplasmic. It, it takes you back to the beginning of life, in effect. And you're fighting for your life. That's what it felt like, Sam. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is, when I said, what's your advice if you're involved with one, get away. No contact. Only. My only advice. Get away. Don't bother with all these techniques. These techniques <clears throat> are, are just ways for you to stay. You're trying to convince yourself to stay. So you say, well, there's a way to manage it. It's manageable. Don't worry. I, oh, great rock. Yeah, sure. I can manage. This is nonsense. You can't fight the narcissist. Narcissist is a superior apex predator. <laughs> there's no way you can, you can survive this. Who doesn't care about what he or she has to do to win. Doesn't care. Predators don't care. Last time I spoke to a COVID-19 virus, he didn't seem to care. It didn't. It didn't have too much compassion, did it? It didn't have compassion and, and so on. <laughs> also, it was not highly intelligent, as far as I could see. But it's it's um, efficacious. It killed six million people. You know, like another virus Sam, I, with a mustache. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I I really want to, you know, thank you again for your time on a Sunday afternoon and Always just to acknowledge. I know I've said this in emails, but I'm going to say it again that. And when you, when the book is, is finally out, you will obviously get mailed a copy and I'm afraid you're going to find yourself all over it. So thank you for, your, <laughs> for all, all of your, your contributions. A, narcissist to, wet, wet dream. Thank you. Well, precisely. <laughs> thank you, thank Sam. You. Charles, always good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Cheers for now, Sam. Don't be a stranger. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Good afternoon, Sam. Hi. Hi, Charles. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And yourself? I'm okay, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are strange days. <laughs> strange days. Busy. More busy than ever, actually. So I am in the organizing committee of well over 90 international conferences. And we have to move all of them online. And uh, I'm editor in 50-something academic magazines, editor-in-chief. Wow. Of uh, of five academic journals. Wow. And you can you can imagine the influx, and uh, everyone wants to write about the psychology of COVID, and this, <laughs> that, neuroscience. Yes. And, uh, so I'm I'm utterly snowed under. Well, I got, got to sleep at four and so on, and that's why when I coordinate something, I put aside everything. It's, absolutely, um, absolutely. It's, it's quite a shambles if it doesn't happen. Absolutely, so, uh, has a ripple effect, uh, and it makes that. makes me even more grateful for for giving uh, us some of no, your, no. your time. No, don't don't worry at all. I I do <clears throat> I did want to I do indeed want to talk to you. It's just that it created a <laughs> a chain reaction that's going to cost me a few hours of sleep. But don't mind that. Don't, don't worry about it. And, we don't know. Th thank you. You know, firstly, before and I, I've written so many questions down as a result of our uh, talk last week. Are we are we on now? Are we being Ye recorded? Yes, I'm using an application called CallNote, and the reason that I do that is because it gives an, a very nice quality recording. So it's I'm looking okay. at it now, and it's definitely recording. All right, but when you when you send me the file, uh, kindly make sure that it's MP3 and not, for example, M4 M, uh, M4A. Yes, or because yes. They, they have uh, all kinds of. So I can process only M MP3, MP3 and MP4. Got it. Yeah, fantastic. MP3 is, is by far the best. Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. 
So, Sam, I've got uh, a million questions for you here, so <laughs> let's start. Oh, yeah, the whole pandemic, the whole pandemic, <laughs> so, you know. Sam, the... I hope, I hope I don't die in the middle, I'm in the bottom of the Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Sam, okay, can we start off by, um, it's, a, it's a question that I get asked a lot, uh, the difference between having narcissistic traits and full-blown clinical narcissistic personality disorder. The first, to, the first to have made such distinctions was one of the granddaddies of the field of personality disorders, Theodore Miller. Mm -hmm. And together with another chap called Davis, his student, they had, they had authored a seminal work called Personality Disorders in Daily Life. It is there that Millen made the distinction between personality disorders, personality style, personality, personality, and he suggested that we are all placed on a spectrum. Today, his, his approach is widely accepted in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition five, published in 2013, the latest, incorporates his thinking. It's dimensional. It, it, it describes spectra. And so we are all on a spectrum. Hmm. And what Millen had suggested is that everyone to this or that extent is a narcissist. Some people um, are grandiose, some people are obnoxious, like me, for example, mm -hmm. some people are, but, but we all, some people like empathy, some people are exploitative, some people are envious, some people have a, a conf combination of some of these traits, and so on and so forth. And he suggested that some people have a personality, uh, a narcissistic personality, and that would simply mean that they have the proclivities and predilections and inclinations to <clears throat> react in highly specific ways in, in certain circumstances. And they would tend to be a bit grandiose. They would tend to be insensitive to other people's needs, emotions, priorities, and wishes. They would tend to be a bit self-centered and so on. That's the personality. Mm. And then there's a personality style. Mm. Personality style, narcissistic personality style, is, is simply all this uh, um, amplified. So these people would actively actually engage in, in narcissistic behaviors and actively translate their narcissistic traits into behaviors that are supposed to secure favorable outcomes from the human environment. Mm. And then there's the disorder. And the disorder is not only quantita quantitatively different to the style, it's not the style amplified, but it's qualitatively different. It's a break. It's schismatic. It's like it's like a break from the style. It's the, because the disorder is actually dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't guarantee favorable outcomes. The the person with a narcissistic style actually gets his way. Mm. He gets his way. He leverages institutions. He collaborates with other people to obtain goals. Um, he he has accomplishments. He's a pillar of society. He's you know the the, the personality style is actually a positive adaptation. It allows you to function better in society mm. and with other people. The disorder, as the name implies, is dysfunctional. It guarantees negative outcomes. It is self-destructive. It alienates people. It, uh, it repels them. It, it makes you um, um, a hate figure. It, so it's, uh, the disorder is all these, the traits and behaviors, taken to such an extreme and to the exclusion of all other traits and behaviors so that the outcomes are actually negative to the narcissist himself. Right. Now, the, the element, the last point I want to make is this issue of exclusion. The person with narcissistic uh, personality or the person with narcissistic style, which is one step above personality, mm. these people have elements of narcissism which are pretty pronounced, discernible, and, you know, immediately detectable. But they also have other traits and behaviors which are non-narcissistic. And they don't exclude these traits and behaviors. They let them express. So they are not all the time narcissistic. They are narcissistic in reaction to something or under certain circumstances or in certain contexts or when they want to achieve something. But they are not all the time narcissistic. So, for example, if they are in some situations disempathic, they don't show empathy. Mm. In other situations, they would be empathic. Mm -hmm. If in some situations they, they um, in some situations they 
are exploitative. In others, they would be actually collaborative. They would work well, well in teams. Mm. I think an example of this would be President Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump is a grandiose <laughs> narcissist, mm. but he, he uh, I kept saying, he, he doesn't have narcissistic personality disorder. He has a narcissistic style mm. so that other qualities in him, which are non-narcissistic, actually manifest. For example, his ability to work in teams yeah. or to leverage social institutions to his benefit yeah. or to, in some rare cases, display empathy and so on. So the narcissist, the, the person with, with a disorder cannot do this. Mm. His narcissism takes over. It's like a malignancy. That's why I call it malignant self-love. Mm. It colonizes. The narcissism colonizes every dimension of the personality. And the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says that the narcissism in this case is all pervasive. Mm. It's, it's like a cancerous <laughs> cell that takes over. And so nothing is exempt and nothing remains alive under this this overgrowth it's like the narcissist has been body snatched by his own disorder yes what would you say that the the most important traits would be would they be a lack of emotional empathy and interpersonal exploitation well it really depends on the type of narcissist we have quite a proliferation of typologies and by now narcissism has been dissected uh, into numerous subtypes yes the we come across usually uh, one or two var varieties of narcissists we rarely come across the others so we come across typically the grandiose narcissists and we come across the covert narcissists hmm. it's rare to come to come across other types and within the covert and the grandiose narcissist there's another subdivision which I suggested at the time, and that is between somatic and cerebral. Mm -hmm. Now, all these four, uh, all these four are united in, in certain things, but the covert is fundamentally, substantially different to the overt, to the classical. Mm -hmm. And if you want, we can dedicate um, some time to the covert narcissist in a separate question, if, if, if you want yes, to, you're, that, you're in the driver's seat. Absolutely. There was a, a couple of other things that I wanted to ask you uh, before we get there, Sam. Um, the, the, I, I didn't, but I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I, just, I just delineated the typology. <laughs> that's true. So all of, them, all of them are, I think, united by a lack of empathy. Yes. I think that's by far the most important feature. And it's common also to uh, psychopaths, but not to borderlines. Mm -hmm. To some extent, histrionics, but not really. So empathy, lack of empathy um, um, is characteristic of psychopaths and narcissists. Mm. Um, exploitativeness, not necessarily, but I would say grandiosity. Uh, not even grandiosity, but severe cognitive deficits, impaired reality testing. Mm. Now, the reality testing can be impaired via grandiosity. Uh, wrong perception of the self mm. and the limitations of the self or the abilities of the self. That's one type of cognitive deficit. But narcissists have many other types of cognitive deficits. So in some narcissists, grandiosity would be emphasized. In others, other types of deficits. But I would say a misperception of reality one way or another. Mm. So narcissists in this sense, exactly as Kernberg suggested in 1975, Narcissists and borderlines in this sense are on the on the verge of psychosis. They are they're actually almost psychotic in, in the sense that they lose touch with reality very often, very frequently. Now imagine how dangerous it is when a narcissist becomes a leader of a nation or you know a, a, a CEO in a, in a giant company. <laughs> and so I would say that these actually these two, some narcissists are exploitative, other narcissists are envious, pathologically envious. <laughs> Uh, some narcissist, um, and so uh, maybe a third element that I would add that is common to all narcissists is the need for narcissistic supply. Mm. The narcissistic supply is attention in all its forms, both positive, adulation, admiration, and negative, being feared, for example. Mm. Attention in all its kind is narcissistic. Now, narcissist needs narcissistic supply to regulate his internal, internal environment. The narcissistic supply restores a sense of reality because other people tell him what is real and what is not about him and also caters to his grandiosity or other cognitive deficits. The reason I'm hesitating a bit is that because covert narcissists process narcissistic supply very differently to classical narcissists. Covert narcissists 
um, psychodynamically so different to classical narcissists that it's debatable in which sense are they narciss narcissists at all. Mm -hmm. And one of the main differences is in how they relate to grandiosity, how they obtain their supply and what they do with their supply when they get it. Mm -hmm. The narcissist uses narcissistic supply to regulate his internal environment. The covert narcissist uses narcissistic supply to fight off her sense of inferiority. The narcissist, the classic narcissist, feels superior at all times mm. and just uses supply to buttress, to prove his superiority, mm. to substantiate it. Mm. The, the covert narcissist feels inferior at all times and she uses supply to eliminate temporarily this sense of inferiority. Mm. Mm. Sam, the, the uh, you know, when we look at narcissistic abuse, um, there's always abuse guaranteed when one is involved with a narcissist and specifically intimately. Why is this so? Why are we guaranteed to, to get abuse? I think, I think one of the major problems we have <clears throat> is that we are hell-bent on using human vocabulary to describe people, to describe carbon-based entities, mm. which are arguably not entirely human mm. or only partly human. You see, abuse, most abusers are not narcissists and they're not psychopaths and don't even have mental health problems. Most abusers. Abuse in these cases has to do with, with a power play a power matrix. Mm. It's about power. It's the same like rape. Rape is not about sex, it's about power. Mm. And so, but these are essentially normal, post, I mean, healthy people. And they just, they need to assert control over their, their environment. And to assert control, they, they do it through abuse. <laughs> it's a dysfunctional way of asserting, asserting control mm. and establishing certainty. Mm. among healthy people. Mm. A tiny minority of abusers are actually narcissists and psychopaths. So let, let, let's be clear, all narcissists and psychopaths are abusive, right. but very few abusers are narcissists and psychopaths. Mm. Now, narcissists and psychopaths abuse not, not for the same reason that the overwhelming vast majority of abusers abuse. Narcissists and psychopaths abuse as a form of internal regulation. What I'm trying to, to say is that the abuse victim is irrelevant. Yeah. It's, it's not in, an interaction, mm. it's an intra-action. The narcissist especially needs to regulate his internal environment, for example, to support his grandiosity. Mm. And so to accomplish this, he needs to abuse someone because when he abuses someone, for example, he feels superior, mm. he feels omnipotent, mm. he feels omniscient if he abuses her by mocking her knowledge or lack of knowledge, ignorance. So he feels it restores his grandiosity. In other words, the abuse is instrumental in regulating the inner landscape of narcissists. And the abuse victim is incidental. That is why it's so easy for narcissists to replace, to substitute the abuse victim. They discard the abuse victim on a, I mean, they pivot on a dime. They discard one abuse victim and half an hour later, they're there with another. Mm. And the intimate partners of narcissists, mm. they feel interchangeable. They mm. feel commodi commodified. They feel, they feel that they could be replaced by anyone. And they, they, can, they feel not special. Mm. The narcissist takes away the, the partner's feeling of specialness, of being an individual. Because narcissists use other, other people as commodities. He consumes them and they are all the same to him. They are they're all identical to him because he is actually interacting not with the outside, but with the inside. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the psychopath, the psychopath abuses because he is goal oriented. So psychopathic abuse has to do with accomplishing sex, money, power, <clears throat> but these are, these are internal goals. Then the psychopath needs money, power and sex and so on to regulate his internal environment. It's his form of narcissistic supply, if you wish. 
and people just happen to be there. So if you need to steal money from an old lady, you do. And if you're stupid enough to give her money, that's her fault. You, it's, yeah. You said in one of your seminars that actually narcissists take a mental snapshot of their partners or the person they're interacting with and then sort of uh, interject it and deal with that snapshot as opposed to the reality of the person. Yes, that's very true. Snapshotting. The thing is, the thing is that at that moment, there is a divergence of, of treatment, a divergence of, of interrelatedness. When the narcissist meets someone, a person, and he reaches the conclusion that that person could become a source of narcissistic supply, mm. even, for example, by way of becoming an intimate partner mm. or by way of becoming a business partner, but can be or by way of becoming an adulator, a fan, um, you know, student, whatever. When the narcissist reaches the conclusion that someone can become a source of supply, he takes a snapshot of that person. He stores the snapshot in his mind. It's like an avatar. Hmm. It's an introject. He stores this photo in his mind. And from that moment, all the positive emotions that the narcissist possesses are invested in the snapshot, not in the real person. Yeah. And the reason is very simple. The snapshot will never abandon the narcissist. Snapshot will never hurt the narcissist. The snapshot will never cheat the on the narcissist, betray the narcissist. The snapshot will not cause the narcissist pain, challenge the narcissist, undermine the narcissist, etc. Snapshot is, is safe. Wow. So it is in the snapshot that the narcissist invests his, his positive emotions. And what's left? Negative emotions. And he reserves the negative emotions for the real person. Mm. So there is a kind of dichotomy, there's a split, there's a break. Mm. The minute the snapshotting takes place, there are two streams of emotions. All negative emotions are externalized, and in this sense, the narcissist becomes a bit psychopathic. And all, in, all positive emotions are internalized, interjected, and directed at the snapshot. Mm. This is why narcissists are always in a state of shock. Because real life people, <laughs> yeah. real real people in their lives, deviate and diverge from the snapshot. Yeah. The snapshot is permanent and stable, never changes. But real real people in real life, they grow, they change, they change their minds. They, I mean, things happen, and the narcissist cannot countenance the contrast between the static snapshot and the dynamic real life partner, for example. Sure. Sam, at, at what stage does narcissistic personality disorder first show up or become uh, evident in, in, in somebody? When can one see it? We have a serious problem with, us, with the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder because there are at least two phases in life, in early life, where narcissism of the disordered kind, the delusional, fantastic, grandiose narcissism, is actually very healthy and a very welcome phenomenon. That is in the formative years, up until the age of four, more or less, even six, and during adolescence. Adolescents, for, exa adolescents, for example, are technically narcissists. Right. Yeah. And, they are t and it's a very good thing that they are, because their narcissism allows them to objectify the parent, rebel against the parent, defy mm. the parent, mm. psychopathically, and in, in this way, separate from the parent, define boundaries and become an individual. Mm. So the adolescence uh, um, pathological narcissism, and it is, is actually very instrumental in rendering the adolescent a separate individual and therefore is a healthy process. Mm. Exactly the same thing happens with the baby, with the child, with the toddler in the formative years, zero to six. The child needs to become the center of the world. The child needs narcissistic supply. The child lacks empathy. The child is very self-centered and so on. And the reason for this is that the child needs to separate from the mother, mm. needs to begin to put boundaries between uh, itself and the mother, usually. And these boundaries cannot emerge unless the, unless the child becomes a narcissist. Mm. So this is why we never 
diagnose narcissistic personality disorder before age 18 or 21, right. depending on the country. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of teenage and, and, and after teenage. Yeah. 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 Not, not before 18. Uh, it's meaningless to diagnose it before 18 because then it is actually healthy. It should be encouraged. Yes. Sam, we touched uh, last week on the aspect of choice of, mm. of the narcissist. And you said to me, uh, narcissists know exactly what they're doing so it's quite difficult for me to sort of imagine that where i'm i'm doing something that's harmful to somebody else and i'm making that choice to do it and i know i'm doing it so can you explain that sort of dynamic from from the narcissistic perspective that they they're making the choice and they know that it's not a good one but they continue to do it your very brief question contains <laughs> numerous, <laughs> very arguable assumptions. First of all, you are using the word someone else. Mm. You know, we're doing, you're doing he, the narcissist does something bad to someone else. Right. But this assumes that the narcissist perceives the separate existence of other people. And he then perceives them as people. No, neither, neither of these two statements is correct. My first mistake. Yes, I get it. <laughs> not, not a mistake. It's simply that you are you are human, and you the the language breaks down when we try to cope with narcissism and psychopathy. Language itself breaks down, and that's the reason I had to invent so many new terms. And, and even even then, language breaks down because uh, how can you talk about someone who has no internal world, where there's only a void, where there's no empathy? where everything is a reflection. I mean, it's so alien, such an alien experience. And I've just made two YouTube videos about this, comparing narcissists and, and psychopaths to aliens, proper aliens mm -hmm. from other planets. And so narcissists do not recognize the separateness of other people because their own separateness has been sabotaged as children, mm -hmm. undermined. They were not able to separate from their parents as children and individuate, and therefore they are incapable of noticing or accepting the separateness of other people. Even more so, because they were not allowed to individuate, they were not allowed to become individuals and develop boundaries, they do not perceive other people as people. They perceive them as functions, they perceive them as extensions, they perceive them as snapshots, but never as people. So when they do something which is harmful in your terms, they are not doing it to anyone. There's nobody there exactly as there's nobody home inside the narcissist there's nobody out there as well it's a the narcissist existence is an existence of negation it's a, it's not being even even the german philosophers like heidegger didn't go that far right. the narcissist is, is a non-being not a being not an entity he's a non-entity there's nothing inside him and nobody outside him so he cannot harm anyone by definition. Number two, you're assuming that narcissists divide their actions into harmful ones and potentially beneficial, benefactory ones. Mm. That's, that's not true. Narcissists um, weigh their options and their actions in, uh, with a single criteria. Does it bring, does it engender and foster narcissistic supply or not? If it fosters supply, do it. If it doesn't, don't do it. In this sense, narcissists are binary robots. Robots with an extremely simple programming, which essentially um, recognizes only two outcomes in the world. Yes, supply, no supply. And, and that's a narcissist. Now, if this has effect on other people, that's where the psychopathic element of narcissism comes in. If this is an effect on other people, well, too bad for them. They chose to be where they are. They chose to collaborate. They chose to acquiesce. They chose to accept. They chose to obey. They chose, I mean, a narcissist doesn't feel responsible for other people's choices. It's a little like asking a virus, aren't you ashamed that you are killing 80 year olds in caring in care homes? You know? Yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, th that leads me to the next question. Um, <clears throat> uh, narcissist that I have known when I look back and I look into I look at photographs of the eyes Sam the eyes there there is a deadness in the eyes there is a, 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 a an incongruence between the expression on the face 
and in the eyes. The eyes are empty. Does that uh, does that make sense? I believe that you you believe that. There's no <laughs> there's no research to support this. My eyes are very lively, and and people very, very often comment on how you know how lively. Yes. How, yes. So I don't I don't think one can generalize. generalize I think people I think people want to demonize. Uh, the, in their desperate attempt to understand these non entities, these non non human non entities, mm, mm. people are clutching at straws, and they try to translate uh, their tropes, their their ways of perceiving the world, and try to s somehow project them on narcissists. Mm. So, I I don't hold such questions in high regard. Right. Let's put it gently. <laughs> Sam, there was something else that you said recently again in one of your seminars about the the stupidity of narcissistic behavior that uh, that it looks like on the outside that it makes no sense what narcissists do and you said that narcissists i think it was a one of your seminars with richard granin where you said that narcissists are actually they're, they're stupid could you maybe elaborate on that or the behavior rather not intellectually but the behavior well if you're divorced from reality you're bound to make uh, stupid choices. Narcissists are not only divorced from reality, they don't understand people. There's nothing in common with people. They don't have empathy, don't have emotions. So they don't they are like autists. They're like autistic people. They they don't read social cues properly, sexual cues, other cues. They they can't manage properly in society, they can't achieve favorable outcomes, they can't motivate other people to so they are failures in this sense, functional failures, because they don't have they don't have anything in common with the main agents of change and action, which are human beings. Mm, mm. But above all, I think that grandiosity and other cognitive deficits fails them. For example, consider grandiosity. Grandiosity means that you know everything, you're omnip omniscient, and that you're capable of everything, omnip omnipotent. Mm. And so, if you are like that, if you're if you're godlike, no one, for example, can cheat you. No one can deceive you. No one can take anything that's yours. And that's, of course, utter nonsense, because psychopaths eat narcissists for breakfast. Narcissists, consequently, because of their grandiosity, are very gullible, because they assume in advance that they can, that no con artist can do a number on them. They are the easiest prey. Hmm. And so they are buffoonish very often. They, they also, their pomposity, their, you know, verbosity renders them buffoonish. So they are derided, they're mocked, because they're obnoxious, they provoke all kinds of retali retaliatory measures by everyone around them. Mm. So they are, they're pitiable, actually, they're pathetic. And, and yet they believe themselves to be superior. They believe themselves to be, um, you know, the life of the party, the most amazing ph phenomenon and phenomenon around. And it is this discrepancy between what they really are and what they really are is the, they are clowns. They are pathetic, pitiable, broken clowns. Um, and everyone sees through them. They're highly transparent and they're highly manipulable. All you have to do to manipulate a narcissist is flatter them. And the more unrealistic the flattery, the further you will get. Yes. Yes. And so they are, they are childlike. They're absolutely childlike. And they're gullible, and they're naive, and they're stupid, and they are everything, you know. And they are so incapable of discerning how vulnerable they are. Sam, something else you said that I found really, really interesting and I never thought of before, and that is that identity involves memory. And what you were saying, uh, again, in one of your seminars, uh, that narcissists have no emotional connection to their memories and therefore will forget things very quickly, like studying, cramming for an exam and forgetting it a couple of weeks later. Uh, I find that very, very interesting, Sam. Could you elaborate on that? There are two problems with memory with narcissists. First of all, there's no emotional correlate. We know from memory studies that memories are actually schemas. They are, they are amalgams. They are amalgams of cognitions, thoughts, emotions, and circumstances. So information about the environment, and where the memory had happened, the context of the memory. Mm. In the absence of any of these three elements, 
if you're missing the thoughts, if you're missing the emotions, or if you're missing the actual data, where the, where the memory happened, um, no memory forms. And this is precisely why, for example, when we overdrink and we're in an alcoholic blackout, mm. no memories are formed. No memories are formed because the alcohol prevents the formation of, of contextual memory. So you don't remember where you are, what you're doing, and so on. Mm. Emotions are there, cognitions are there, but not the context. And uh, Alzheimer, in Alzheimer, emotions are frequently there, context is there, but no cognition, mm. no thinking. So also memories don't form. Whenever any of the three, and in the case of the narcissist, usually all three are missing. All three, I want you to understand how bad this is. Wow. Narcissist is totally discontinuous. It's like the narcissist is reinvented every minute of the day, totally out of whole cloth. And so the narcissist doesn't have cognitions because he is dissociative. Narcissists suffer from dissociation, yeah. memory lapses, memory gaps, lost time, and they don't remember what they have thought. Honestly, they're not lying. They simply don't remember. So there's a lack of cognition, then there's no emotions, no access to emotions, goes without saying. And very often they forget the context because they are so focused on obtaining supply that they don't pay attention to their environment. A narcissist could go through a whole vacation in, a, in the most gorgeous Greek island, and all he would remember is how a beautiful uh, girl smiled at him. But he wouldn't, he would not remember the beaches or the sun or the, you know. So context, contextual, contextual data is, is missing. And so consequently, narcissists are utterly incapable of forming long-term memories. Even worse, I would say, than dementia. And so what narcissists do instead, they confabulate. They speculate as, what would I have, have remembered had I been capable of remembering? What would have made sense? What would have been probable? What would have been plausible? And so they confabulate. They bridge these gaps. They cover up for the time lapses and they pretend to remember. And then they get emotionally invested or invested at least in what they're saying, the confabulation, and it becomes reality for them. So they are unable to distinguish their confabulations from reality because anyhow, the reality testing is screwed up. <laughs> And so they end up living in a twilight zone, not quite certain what they had invented and what was really happened. And you can't imagine how destabilizing this but, feeling is. But, but Sam, that must be terrifying. I mean, it is you forget one's entire life. I mean, I've had blackouts and I couldn't remember anything and that scared me. But I mean, this is a, you forget, a narcissist forgets his entire life. If you had alcoholic blackouts and you know the experience, this is the permanent state of the narcissist. Yeah. That's the permanent state of the narcissist. Now you know that in an alcoholic blackout, you maintain full executive functions. Mm. You can make decisions, you talk, you walk, you drive a car, you, I mean, that's why people from the outside can't tell that you have, you're having a blackout. And it's the same with the narcissist. He walks, he talks, but he's in a state of blackout. But his state is permanent. Now, what do you do after you wake up from a blackout? You say to yourself, what on earth has happened? What has happened? The last thing I remember is this. So probably this is what had happened. You speculate. Or you call a friend. <laughs> or you call a friend, you call others. Yeah. And this is narcissistic supply. Now, now, you hit, now you understand what is narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is a desperate attempt to cover for the blackout by asking people, Please tell me about myself, because I don't remember anything. Am I really a genius? I think I am. I have this vague recollection that I am, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe I invented it a minute ago. I don't know if it's a memory or if it's a piece of fiction that I've just conjured up. You know. So the confabulation, and, sorry, Sam, is a is a panic response. It's a it's a yes. panic response. Yes, I think, and uh, that that narcissism could be. Um, conceived as um, an anxiety disorder or a, a depressive disorder uh, involving a panic, constant panic attack, like being in a, in a constant state of panic attack. And of course, narcissists don't experience this. They don't feel it. But they, are, should, be, they should behave this way. You should see a narcissist, for example, if his grandiosity is challenged. 
He's not reacting like you have insulted him. He's reacting like he's about to die. Yeah. Oh. Sam, are there particular qualities or traits that narcissists look for in their intimate partners? Are there definitions or grades of, of supplier? Yeah, supply like everything else, like, like drugs, exactly like drugs. Mm -hmm. There's high quality drugs, diluted drugs, mixed drugs, tainted drugs and so on. So there's high, co high quality supply, low quality supply, fake supply. Uh, narcissists sometimes discerns when people are faking the supply <laughs> and so on and so forth. Now, low, low quali high quality supply reflects the high quality of the source. So, um, if uh, someone in the street would tell me I'm a genius, it's not the same uh, if, the, if Noam Chomsky calls me up and tells me I'm a genius. Mm. <laughs> it's the same sentence, you're a genius. But of course, Chomsky has priorities. His supply is high quality, high grade. Mm. Um, so, intimate partner is someone who is idealized, and that's precisely the reason, by the way, that the narcissist idealizes his partner. He idealizes his partner because he needs to convert her into a high quality source. So the narcissist constructs an ideal image of his partner, which has very little to do with his real life partner, by the way. Right. And this, this ideal image is perfect. It's a reflection of the narcissist's own false self. She, she's perfect. She's brilliant. She's amazing. She's unique. She's special. She's this. She's that. She's super sexy. She's the, and And then by idealizing her, he had converted her into a high source, high level source, high quality source, and everything that emanates from her, all the supply that comes from her, is a high quality supply. Mm -hmm. Now, how can the narcissist succeed? How does he succeed to idealize? It's very easy. I gave you the key earlier. The narcissist idealizes the snapshot, not the real person. Mm -hmm. All the narcissist's interactions are with the snapshot. He idealizes a snapshot, he interacts with a snapshot, he obtains object constancy by keeping the snapshot constant. He doesn't have abandonment anxiety because snapshots don't tend to abandon their owners. Last time I checked. <laughs> and, and, and so snapshotting is a super critical fact function in narcissism. And this is the mistake of the narcissist in the partners and why they are heartbroken and devastated. At some point, they discover that it's not been about them at all. They mm. haven't been there. <laughs> They've been an excuse, mm. a kind of a trigger. And the, it becomes clear to them that the Nazis have been interacting with some ideal, idealized image, idealized figure that has nothing or little to do with them. And then it makes it completely, uh, it makes it very easy for him to discard them and replace them within minutes mm. because he has never been interacting with them. Sam, another question. Hello? Uh, Sam, you still there? Yeah. yeah. Um, another, another question before we get on to the different um, types of narcissist is the, the formation or the lack of formation of empathy in the narcissist in the, in the formative years. Could you explain how that happens or how that doesn't happen? I'm talking about emotional empathy. I wish I had the answer. We know that there are three types of empathy and they build on each other. They build upon each other. There's reflexive empathy. That's the kind when baby smiles at mother because my mother smiles at baby. Mm. That's reflexive, like a reflection. And then there is cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy is uh, I see my, I see someone crying as a, as a child. I see someone crying and I note the fact that she's crying, but nothing happens. I just note the fact. And then there's emotional empathy. Gradually, the child builds a theory of the world and a theory of mind and um, incorporates himself or herself into this theory, a process called introspection. In, in other words, the child constructs a self by contradistinction to the world. And then there is interaction with this self and uh, the ability to put, to, to manipulate this self. And for example, to take this self and put it in someone else's shoes. And these are the foundations of empathy. Narcissists have reflexive empathy that, that comes with biology. They have, and they develop cognitive empathy. And so the combination of reflexive and cognitive is what I call, what I dubbed cold empathy. Mm. Because they never graduate to the third phase. 
they, they never develop emotional empathy. And the reason I think they don't develop emotional empathy is because the narcissist is terrified of his emotions. Within the narcissist, there is a reservoir of enormous pain and hurt, of not being seen, of being negated, of being manipulated, manipulated, of being abused, of being vitiated, of being invaded. These are huge pains, especially if they're inflicted on the child by a godlike, uh, unconditionally loved figure, like a mother. <clears throat> And so there's this huge pain inside. Now, I think we discussed this last time, I'm not sure, but it's not possible to tap into only one sort of emotion. You can't tell yourself, I'm going to ignore my negative emotions, I'm going to tap only into my positive emotions. Mm. If you tap into your emotions, everything comes up. Mm. Everything comes up. Love is bittersweet. We all know this. So if you, if you allow yourself to love, then all the pain and the hurt will will surface as well yeah. and the narcissist will be overwhelmed and die commit suicide or something so narcissists are so terrified of their emotions they bottle them up they they relegate them like the environmental protection agency they relegate this toxic waste into underground reservoirs they seal them with lead and they you know <laughs> they make sure they never ever have access to to these emotions anymore unfortunately in this process of sealing off the toxic emotions. They are forced also to seal off all emotions. It's not that the narcissists don't have emotions. Narcissists actually are overwhelmed by their emotions. Their emotions are much stronger than other people's. It's just they don't have access to their emotions, as opposed to the borderline. The borderline failed to do this, failed to isolate her emotions, so they keep overwhelming her. And the result, 10% of borderlines commit suicide. So the narcissist is where the, uh, succeeds where the borderline failed, had failed. He, he had isolated and, and buried his emotions irrevocably. Mm. But uh, consequently, of course, he is unable to develop emotional empathy. So it comes with the territory. That's the price the narcissist pays. Lack of empathy, lack of love, lack of positive emotions, lack of positivity in life generally. That's why narcissism can be easily conceived as a depressive state depressive disorder mm. and uh, general feeling of hostility uh, aggression defiance and so on which push the narcissist throughout life to the psychopathic pole i think that psychopathy uh, I, I, I i mean many narcissists end up being psychopaths i mean there are psychopaths who are born as psychopaths mm. uh, psychopathy is largely a brain disorder and so there are psychopaths who are born as psychopaths, but I think narcissists expose repeatedly to the slings, slings and arrows of fate, to borrow from someone else, uh, ultimately end up being psychopaths, antisocial and, and so on, because it's, it's simply too much. And the lack of emotional empathy also hampers the reality test, so they keep blundering, they keep it's like they're like blind people in a dark space <laughs> with no candle. <laughs> Like a wrecking ball, in a way. Well, yes, and as conscious, as self-aware as a wrecking ball. <laughs> Sam, uh, uh, another thing um, that I've, I've wondered about often is the narcissists will often, especially as they get older, they will have a, a whole trail of, of wrecked marriages or, you know, uh, uh, love affairs and partners, etc. What effect does that have on the narcissist, the sort of accumulated damage and carnage, if you like, and to their, well, to their psyche? Just said, it becomes a psychopath. These are uh, slings and arrows of fate. The wasteland that his life had become. The post-apocalyptic dystopian landscape hmm. that his life inevitably becomes. There's not a single narcissist who doesn't end up this way, even if he's, I don't know, president of the United States. When he looks around, when he looks inside himself, it's this utterly desert-like wasteland with not a hint of life left. And uh, because he's incapable of experiencing emotions, or he has no access to his emotions, emotions are the main tools we use to process loss. That's the main tool. I mean, mm. If you lack emotions or access to emotions, you are unable to process loss. So the narcissist's life 
ends up being a huge container of losses, cumulative losses. Mm. And the, 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 the dominant feeling, the dominant um, emotional you, you see, I'm lacking words even, it's to this, because it's not an emotion, it's a presence. Mm. It's like a demonic presence, if you wish. So <clears throat> the, at the end of the Nazi's life, there is this presence, which is as tangible as anything, presence of loss. It's like everything coalesced and combined into what this giant loss. It reminds me of a neutron star or a black hole, you know. Mm. Everything imploded and crumbled into this single point of loss. But it is so omnip so so potent, so so powerful that it sucks the narcissist and every light, every shred of life, every shred of hope. It's a hopeless in the in the most profound sense, hopeless existence. Sure. Sam, um, okay, so um, uh, now if we can have a look at uh, the, uh, the the COVID versus uh, either uh, overt or what you say grandiose, uh, the cerebral versus the somatic, we could look at the characteristics and... Yeah, well, um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation about covert narcissists propagated uh, by numerous self-styled experts and so on and so forth, who clearly have never bothered to read the, the literature. Mm. Covert narcissism had been first, was first defined in 1989 by two scholars, Akhtar and Cooper. <clears throat> and they have created a, by now, classic table, which describes the differences between what they called at the time, arrogant or overt narcissists, Today we call it classic narcissism. And what they called at the time the shy or covert narcissist. Mm. Another name for this today would be the fragile or vulnerable narcissist. And so this table is still the authority and the only authority. And if you want, I can simply read it to you. Mm. It's a bit a bit long, but I think it's it's worth every minute. Absolutely. Uh, because that would that would be the, the first, uh, that would be among the few, <laughs> among the few um, uh, YouTube videos to, 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 to provide accurate information Absolutely. about covert losses. Absolutely. So they, they, they distinguish six domains, self-concept, interpersonal relationships, social adaptation, ethics, standards and ideas, love and sexuality, and cognitive style. And what they had done, they in 1989, mind you, they uh, made a list of these six domains in the covert narcissist versus the overt narcissist. I'm simply going to read it to you. Mm. So nothing can compete with the accuracy and clarity of this table. Mm. And I, I'm just repeating again that the vast majority of videos online uh, uh, contradict this table. And uh, uh, these videos are utterly wrong. Generally, there's a phenomenon that everyone and his dog becomes an expert after after having read three three wrong articles. Yes, yes. And it's a it's a malignant what I call malignant egalitarianism. Everyone is an expert today because everyone has a smartphone and can click the right or the wrong buttons. Of course, there's a problem of telling apart what is reliable information, quality information from from trash. Hmm. It's a problem of discoverability, but. I have yet, well, I have come across two videos which describe covert narcissism properly. Uh, all the others, and we're talking about hundreds and thousands, are not, are not accurate. Wrong, actually. Disastrously wrong sometimes. And one, and I, I've had, and I, I have had a personal experience with this. I, in 25 years ago, <clears throat> I created the diagnostic category inverted narcissism. I, I invented it. I, I came up with it, it's mine. Mm. <laughs> and I was the first to describe inverted narcissists in a very, very lengthy paper, almost 100 pages long. And so to this very day, I'm getting numerous messages from people who are telling me that I have no idea what is inverted narcissism, that I'm very wrong about inverted narcissism, that I should see that link or that link to learn about inverted narcissism, not to make such mistakes in the future, and so on and so forth. Mm. It's, um, and I, I invented the diagnosis. They are writing to the person who invented the, the diagnosis to tell him <laughs> that he has no idea what the diagnosis is. No. <laughs> this situation there is really bad. 
and I'm warning against it. There's uh, the ratio of trash, the ratio of noise to signal is 99 to 1. And I'm being exceedingly optimistic. Mm. I will read the, the table and it's the only authoritative source. It's not mine, so I'm not touting my horn. <laughs> it's, it's Akhtar and Cooper, 1989. Self-concept. The arrogant or overt narcissist has grandiosity, preoccupation with fantasies of outstanding success, undue sense of uniqueness, failings of entitlement, seeming self-sufficiency. In contrast, the covert narcissist has an inferiority complex, morose self-doubts, marked propensity toward feeling ashamed, fragility, relentless search for glory and power, marked sensitivity to criticism and realistic setbacks. When it comes to interpersonal relationships, the overt narcissist has numerous but shallow relationships, intense need for tribute from others, scorn for others, often masked by pseudo humility. I called it false modesty in my work, mm. lack of empathy, inability to genuinely participate in group activities, valuing of children of a spouse in family life. The covert narcissist has an inability to genuinely depend on others and trust them, chronic envy of others, talent of other people's talents, possessions and capacity for deep object relations, deep love, a lack of regard for generational boundaries. So that's the kind of person who would insult old people and mm. disrespect them. Disregard for others, other people's time, refusal to, to respond, silent treatment, discommunication. Social adaptation. The overt narcissist is socially charming, often successful, presents consistent hard work done, done mainly to seek admiration, pseudo sublimation, intense ambition, preoccupation with appearances. The covert narcissist has nagging aimlessness, shallow vocational commitment, dilettant attitude, multiple but superficial interests, chronic boredom, aesthetic taste, often ill-informed and imitative. As far as ethics, standards and ideas, ideals, I'm sorry, the overt narcissist is caric has caricatured modesty, pretended contempt for money in real life, idiosync idiosyncratically and unevenly moral, apparent enthusiasm for socio-political affairs. That's the classic narcissist. Mm. The covert narcissist has readiness, is ready to shift her values to gain favor. Pathological lying, materialistic lifestyle, delinquent ten tendencies, inordinate ethnic and moral relativism, irreverence towards authority. And in this sense, the covert narcissist is actually psychopathic, but not the overt narcissist. It, it's, a, it's an example of such a mistake online, because online people say that the classic narcissist is psychopathic, but the covert narcissist is not. It's the covert narcissist that is psychopathic. Love and sexuality, I'm continuing to read from the table. Yes. Love and sexuality, the overt narcissist, marital instability, cold and greedy seductiveness, extramarital affairs and promiscuity, uninhibited sexual life, the covert narcissist, inability to remain in love, impaired capacity for viewing the romantic partner as a separate individual with his or her own interests, rights and values. Inability to genuinely comprehend the incest taboo, occasional sexual perversions, paraphilia, cognitive style, the classic narcissist, impressively knowledgeable, decisive and opinionated, often strikingly articulate, egocentric perception of reality, love of language, fondness of shortcuts to acquisition of knowledge, the covert narcissist, knowledge often limited to trivia, headline intelligence forgetful of details, especially names, impaired in the capacity for learning new skills, tendency to change meanings of reality when faced with a threat to self-esteem, language and speaking used for regulating his, his or her self-esteem. This and only this is the authoritative description of overt and covert narcissists. Wow. Anything that contradicts, anything that stands in contradiction to this is wrong. End of story. Never mind who says it, including people with PhDs 
therapists, psychologists, and so on. Mm. Degrees don't guarantee knowledge. Many degrees come with ignorance, academic degrees. So be careful, go to the source. Mm. It's available online, not such a big deal. Akhtar, A-K-H-T-A-R, and Cooper, 1989, covert narcissism. Sam, would you, yeah, I mean, that's a sort of a five-hour discussion on its own, all of that, but the, the one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, it's very interesting, um, <clears throat> would you say that covert narcissists are more dangerous because they're hidden, you can't see it? Covert narcissists are what are, co are confluence, a combination of passive-aggressive mm. and psychopathic. So. Yes, I would say that covert narcissists are far more dangerous because you don't see them coming. Mm. And when they do come, they act as psychopaths. So we, we today are reconceptualizing borderline personality disorder. We are reconceptualizing it as psychopathy. Today, the bleeding edge literature discusses borderline personality disorder as secondary psychopathy in women. <clears throat> <clears throat> women's secondary psychopathy. Similarly, covert narcissism, I think, can be easily conceptualized or reconceptualized as the confluence of narcissism, frustrated narcissism, collapsed narcissism, with psychopathy, secondary psychopathy, not, not primary, secondary psychopathy, and uh, passive aggressiveness, negativistic personality disorder. And yes, it's a bad com combination, <laughs> far worse than the overt one. Yeah, it doesn't the sound overt good to me. classical narcissist is easily detectable. Yes, he cannot hide. He cannot hide his grandiosity, his pomposity, his verbosity. He is ridiculous. He's buffoonish. He's, I mean, you can immediately tell. I mean, look for example at Donald Trump. Yes, you, it doesn't take a genius or a diagnostician to realize something's wrong with this guy. Mm, his need for praise. His hypervigilance for uh, against insults. He sees insults everywhere. Something's wrong with this guy. Something's wrong with his cognitive processing, and it's so clear. However, look at Barack Obama. Barack Obama, who is as narcissistic, if not much more, than <clears throat> Donald Trump, stealth under the radar, hmm. socially sublimates his narcissism, converts it into socially acceptable modes of behavior. Hmm. Hmm. but equally narcissistic, messianic almost. Hmm. So uh, luckily, both individuals didn't leverage the narcissism and they, they took the narcissism and they channeled it in socially acceptable ways via social institutions. But if you have someone like Adolf Hitler, you know, that's not always the case. So um, covert narcissism is a very, very dangerous thing. Uh, luckily, as opposed to what most online videos say and so on, covert narcissists rarely conspire and manipulate and, I mean, they, they are rarely busy promoting some agenda. They are too shy and broken and vulnerable and fragile. They're too, they feel inferior. They are too perfectionist. So many, many things are holding them back. They're in the background. They're in the background and they rarely act. However, when they do act, they act as psychopaths do. They are manipulative, they are impulsive, they are defiant, they are disempathic, and, and so on. And they are passive-aggressive. Most of the time, what they do is they undermine you, they sabotage you, they, they block you, they obstruct you, they, you know, and they, they constantly feel uh, that they are discriminated against, that they are subject to injustice, that they are being mistreated, that their talents are not recognized. And, and so, so they, they constantly stew and simmer and, and seethe in resentment and, yes. and fury and suppressed fury and rage and, and so on. <laughs> and I would say that in terms of collectives, we have reached a, a condition in the world which is similar to the 1930s, where the vast majority of collectives in the world, nation states and so on, <laughs> felt essentially um, like, like covert narcissists. Uh, the Germans in, 19, in the 1930s gave rise to Nazism and Adolf Hitler precisely because they were in a covert Nazi state of mind. Mm. Mm. And today, Trumpism, or the phenomenon of, of Trump, is founded on the covert narcissism of large swaths of the American population. 
These are people who think they deserve better. They got the, the short end of the stick. No. But when you, if you were to investigate, why do you think you deserve better? What are, what are, what are your merits? What are your talents? What are your skills? Yeah. What's your education? Why do you think you deserve better? Well, the, the fact is they don't deserve better. It's an, it, so when, it's you divorce, an when you divorce from reality, the test is, are you divorced from reality? If you are really a genius and you are being mistreated, or if you are really educated and you, know, you don't get a job, I mean, that's a justified grievance. It's a justified grievance. The grievances embedded in, embedded in the American Constitution are justified. The, these were realistic grievances. But if your grievances are founded on an impaired reality testing, on wrong self-perception, because you don't perceive reality, you have a cognitive deficit, that's sickness. That's a pathology. And yes, patholo collectives can be pathologized this way. Absolutely. And, what, and then they give rise to inverted narcissism because the relationship between the base of Donald Trump, the voters of Donald Trump and Donald Trump is exactly like the relationship between an inverted narcissist and a classic narcissist. Because what the inverted narcissist does, she uses the glory, she basks in the glory, in the reflected glory of her classic narcissist. Mm. These, these bikers and blue collar workers and uneducated masses and so on, all over the United States, they bask in the glory of Donald Trump. It's like his light reflects on them. Yeah. And I'm mentioning Donald Trump as an example, but you have the same in the Philippines and the same in Brazil and the same in Hungary and mm. the same everywhere. There's a rise of class, class of overt, of overt grandiose narcissists, Erdogan in Turkey, Putin in Russia, Duterte, Bolsonaro, I mean, you name it, Netanyahu. I mean, you have a class of narcissists and psychopaths who took over the world, literally. Why? Because the underlying populace is a covert narcissist. And their only way to obtain narcissistic supply is via the Führer, via the leader. We have reverted to the Führer principle all over the world. That's <laughs> fascinating. Absolutely. Um, Sam, would you say that the, the COVID narcissist, that, that there is a a splitting between self-hatred and grandiosity? Is there sort of a, a shift between those two all the time, inside? The covert narcissist has a very negative self -hatred. That's the difference. That's the main difference between the covert narcissist and the overt narcissist. Mm. The covert narcissist has a very negative <clears throat> self image mm. A self-image that is essentially depressive. I'm no good. I'm a zero. I'm a failure. I can get nowhere. I can learn nothing. I cannot study, I cannot attain degrees, I cannot find a job, I cannot date a girl, I cannot so. Uh, in a dialogue, constant in a uh, ticker tape, um, in, inside the covert narcissist, is I cannot do, I cannot be, I cannot accomplish. The inner dialogue of the overt narcissist is exactly the opposite. I can do anything I want. I can accomplish anything if I set my mind to it. Co coaches like Tony Robbins and, and Jordan and people like Jordan Peterson, they are catering to this internal narcissistic dialogue. If you, you there's a giant inside you, they tell you, <laughs> you have, you just need to wake it up, you know, and if you just put your mind to it, there's nothing you cannot do. The law of attraction, the secret, you know, mm. these are all super narcissistic messages, mm. and, but they cater only to overt or classic narcissists. The covert narcissist would reject such messages. For example, covert narcissist feels very, very ill at ease, very bad when she receives narcissistic supply directly. If you were to go to a covert narcissist and tell her, you know what, you're extremely talented, she would be very, very discomfited. She would try to avoid you from that moment on. Uh, but if you go to a classic narcissist and you tell her, you're very, very talented, you would become her favorite. Mm. A favorite. Mm. You, know, you may even end up having a one night stand. It's uh, it's all it takes. <laughs> so, so it, the differences are um, are critical. Mm. The differences between covert and overt narcissists are so fundamental and foundational and profound that it's debatable whether the the, the word narcissism fits here. I would I would use a word that Miller used, which I find much more appropriate. 
He called these types compensatory types. These are types who try to compensate for what Adler called an innate inferiority complex. Mm. And the way they are doing this is by uh, creating grandiose fantasies which they are trying to realize via third parties. Mm. I mentioned, I think last time we spoke, Frau Doctor. Mm. In Germany in the 19th century, if you were a woman with zero education, but you were married to a doctor, everyone in the city called you mm. Frau Doctor. Mm. Mm. That's a perfect example of covert inver or inverted Nazism. Because by herself, she would have never attempted to become a doctor. She would not have trusted herself to complete a degree and so on. Mm. But by getting married to a, to a real doctor, by reflection, she became a doctor. And that satisfies her grandiose fantasy. Mm. So um, the covert narcissist landscape, inner landscape, is a landscape of doubt, a landscape of shame, a, a landscape of shyness, a landscape of avoidance. It's a, it's a landscape of, of recalcitrance and withdrawal from the world. While the, the, the narcissist, the classic narcissist, is impelled, impelled and compelled to approach the world in order to extract from the world, by force if necessary, narcissistic supply. Mm. And Sam, the cerebral versus, versus somatic? When the narcissist tries to obtain supply, the first question is, of course, what are the assets that <laughs> are at my disposal, which I can leverage to obtain supply? So if you're an idiot with muscles, you will use your muscles. <laughs> if you are intellectually endowed, then you would use your intellect. And so there are two types of narcissists the brawn and the brain. There are those narcissists who use sex, bodybuilding, appearance, looks, attire. They, they cultivate, they nurture their external appearance, <clears throat> and they use it to obtain supply. And because the only thing you can obtain with external appearance is sex, there's no other thing you can really obtain with it, in today's environment at least, that's their supply, sex. So they use their external appearance to obtain casual sex partners, the more the better. Then this is the supply. And they are the somatic narcissists. Soma in Greek, yeah. ancient Greek, means body. body. The cerebral narcissists are narcissists who are intellectually endowed to some extent, or to a very large extent. And they use their intellect for precisely the same reason. They, they're intellectually pyrotechnic fireworks, you know, intellectual fireworks. And that get that that garners supply. For example, I'm giving you an interview, that's supply. So um, their intellect, they display their intellect, they're exhibitionistic, both types are exhibi exhibitionistic. Mm. They display their intellect, they, they bring into the, on, into the table their brain, their mind, amazing mind, kaleidoscopic, colorful, stunning, synoptic mind. And this, this gets them supply. Now, one thing that, that people, I think, are very confused about, there is no type constancy. Cerebral can become somatic and does become somatic. Whenever the cerebral loses a source of supply or when the cerebral is, is faced or confronts a willing partner, he becomes somatic mm. on a dime. No problem whatsoever. So if a guru or a top level intellectual were to meet a, a very, very beautiful student who would offer him sex, trust me, he would become somatic that very second. Um, somatic and cerebral are modes of obtaining supply and narcissists are not picky, not choosy, whatever works. But for the intellectual narcissist, for the, for the intelligent narcissist and so on, what works is usually the intellect. So while there's no type constancy, there's type dominance recessive and dominant. So the, the intellectual, the cerebral narcissist would emphasize this. Now, usually cerebral narcissists don't look so good. I mean, they're not, uh, you know. So it's difficult for them to obtain willing partners, willing sexual partners and so on. So they end up in most cases being celibate and, and they focus on their intellect because their intellect guarantees a stream of, a stream of narcissistic supply, an interrupted stream. So why waste the time on, on try to obtain sex when failure is almost guaranteed. Similarly, the somatic narcissist doesn't bother to develop his 
intellectual faculties, if he has any, because his muscles do the do the job pretty well. Mm. It's a default state. We all tend to gravitate towards what we do best. Mm. Mm. And and what the intellectual does best is to talk. What the cerebral does, what the somatic does best is to display his body and then use it in sex. So they both end up doing almost exclusively this. But there is type fluidity. Narcissists, all narcissists are both, if they can manage it. Would the cerebral be less view the body as a <clears throat> as an irritation because it's the brain that is focused on that it's 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 an yes. irritation yeah yeah not only an irritation but a source of negative narcissistic supply a hindrance i mean it's not it's it's not pleasant to be rejected by women all the time hmm. you're you're a genius you know that you're unique you know that you're this but while a woman takes one look at you and goes the other way and she usually goes the other way with the somatic narcissist who is not five percent your intellect you know and so the body, body becomes a source of frustration. Yeah. And we have a hypothesis by Dollard in 1939. Dollard discovered that frustration is invariably co converted to aggression. Mm. So narcissists, cerebral narcissists, are very aggressive towards their bodies. Because their bodies are sources of, of frustration, mm. they neglect their bodies. They, to they punish their bodies. They tend to ignore their bodies. They're very neglected. Their health is, is failing and so on. And they don't exercise. They overeat mm. because their bodies constantly frustrate them. Now, with the, the, with the somatic, um, Sam, if there is a, a lot less intelligence there, then that somatic narcissist can't be cerebral because there isn't the intelligence there to support it. So that would be uh, it's sort of difficult to do that, whereas the cerebral can... How can lucky how lucky we are that we have 8 billion people because even the somatic can find women who are much more stupid than he is <laughs> and can be impressed by his infinite intelligence. <laughs> right. Uh, and Sam, the, the covert uh, female somatic narcissist, can you give us the, the, the characteristics of, of them and, and how, they, how they see their partners, how they work with their intimate partners? Well, that's... The vast majority of covert narcissists are women. Right. So it's a bit re it's a bit redundant to ask about covert female. female. Mm. Mm. Most most covert narcissists are women, mm. and most border exactly as most borderlines are women. Uh, the male covert narcissist is extremely rare because male are testosterone laden, laden and they are <clears throat> they are uh, usually extroverted, extroverted. And they they go out there and they get things done, and they're hunters, you know. Mm. So. The vast majority of, of classic narcissists are, um, are male, about 75%, we think, are male. And the vast majority of covert narcissists, probably also 75%, no one made a study, but probably, um, are female. Mm. And so the question is redundant. I mean, there's nothing to add, because what I've just described mm. regarding covert narcissists is about female narcissists. Mm. Mm. And in terms of the, uh, you said in another seminar that the the, the covert um, somatic narcissist in intercourse views the partner as almost a, a dead object. I think you said something like that. The narcissist, not the covert narcissist. The covert narcissist would would tend to be would tend to be largely asexual, actually, because the covert narcissist has a, a deep set inferiority complex. She also usually has body dysmorphic disorders. Mm. Mm. She, she misperceives her body as too fat, too ugly, too old, too something. So she would generally avoid sex. She would be either um, a teaser, mm. um, and in this case, she would have comorbid histrionic personality disorder. Mm. But even if she's histrionic, she would still avoid sex. She would be what used to be called frigid. Mm. She would, she would engage in sex only when she is disinhibited. So many of these women would drink on purpose in order to engage in sex. They would abuse substances. They would drink alcohol or smoke, weed or something in order to engage in sex, because otherwise they can't. To give them the they freedom. Would, they need to, yes. to, to give them, disinhibit. To, give them to, disinhibit to disinhibit them. Part of their inhibitions, part of the reason they don't have sex in a normal state is that their covert narcissism inhibits them. The, the, the feeling that they are imperfect, that they're inadequate, that they're repulsive, that they are 
inhibits them, of course. And so they, to overcome this, they drink and so on, and then they are disinhibited. Mm. They have a grandiose view of themselves. There's something called alcohol myopia. Mm. It's uh, when you drink, you become grandiose and you, you think you can do anything. You, you perceive your own attractiveness and the attractiveness of people around you very wrongly. It's known as beer, beer goggles. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so it changes things and allows the covert narcissist to have sex, but normally she would be sexless or asexual. Uh, the, it is the narcissist who regards sex as a, a form of, of competition. So mm. it's the narcissist, for example, who would, mon who would ask his, uh, who would monitor how many times his partner climaxed, mm. orgasmed. Mm. And uh, would monitor other performance parameters, or even inquire openly: uh, Was I good? Was I good? Was I, was was I as good as last time? Mm -hmm. Was I as good as your last boyfriend? It's a scorecard. He keeps a scorecard of uh, it's, it's a whole one big uh, quiz quiz show or something. <laughs> so narcissists are competitive and ambitious and grandiose in sex in sex as well, mm -hmm. and they use the partner's body to masturbate with, on, and in. There's no real interrelatedness or interconnectedness, but the partner is perceived as an animated dildo if if the woman if it's a woman or animated sex doll with taste and smells on the periphery, and so they they masturbate with the partner's body. It's very autoerotic. In other words, the eroticism and this was observed first observed by Freud. The eroticism of the narcissist, the libido, the sex drive, is directed at the self not at others, mm. because object relations, the ability to perceive others is interrupted in early childhood. The narcissist sex drive never is never externalized, it's internalized. Mm. And so the narcissist needs, regards himself as the erotic object. It's very common for narcissists in during the sexual act to actually look at themselves in the mirror right. uh, or, or stop in the middle of the sex act, stop, and have a look at their own bodies. Like, yes, good afternoon. Thank you for calling. And thank you for your, uh, for your time on this interview, Sam. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, shall we not talk about coronavirus, Sam? It's entirely up to you. <laughs> Sam, I, you know, you're a, a, a real pioneer in this field. You've been involved in it in the last 25 years, I think, and you've coined a lot of the terms that we all use today, uh, narcissistic supply, different types of narcissists, etc. That's, um, quite, that's quite accurate, although narcissistic supply was not coined by me. Ah. It was, it's a coinage from 1938. What I did is I took quite a few terms and phrases used in other branches of psychology. Yes. And I've adapted them to, to describe narcissism and narcissistic abuse. But you're right that I've coined the overwhelming vast majority of the rest of the language, including <laughs> narcissistic abuse, ghosting, hovering, I mean, you name know, yes. flying monkeys, yes. uh, I, narcissistic fleas and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So Sam, I mean, I, I'm familiar with your material. I've watched your seminars and your, um, your broadcasts over and over. And I think you're insight uh, is remarkable. Uh, so I just want to say that. Um, Sam, you, in some of your recent seminars, you, you highlight uh, the fact that when you're dealing with a narcissist, that there's nobody there. You keep saying that, that it's an illusion. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, I could, shockingly. <laughs> Do tell me though, are we being recorded? Yes. Are you sure of that? Yes, we are, yes. Yes, we are. Great. Okay. Well, the narcissist is a product of childhood trauma and abuse. Of course, there are two developmental pathways to narcissism. Mm -hmm. One is when the child is elevated, put on a pedestal or conflated with a pedestal and is pampered and spoiled and isolated from the environment and so on and so forth. And therefore, the parent assumes the role of a boundary. Mm -hmm. It is the parent that isolates the child from reality, which is a very good definition of a boundary. Mm -hmm. And so because the parent assumes the role of a boundary, the child is not allowed, cannot technically separate from the parent and individuate, cannot become an individual. Mm -hmm. And so when the, when the child cannot become an individual, he or she, most often he, doesn't simply. He does not become an individual. He does not become. There's not becoming in this developmental pathway. 
The other developmental pathway to narcissism, both of them lead to narcissism, the other developmental pathway is via classical forms of abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, psychological and verbal abuse, and so on and so forth. And these also constitute, of course, a breaching of boundaries, a breaching of emergent boundaries. Mm. The child in both cases <clears throat> is unable to form an individual, uh, separate an entity separate from the rest of the world. Now, in this sense, and only in this highly restricted sense, narcissists are actually codependents, because it's the same dynamic with a codependent. The codependent seeks to merge or fuse with a significant other. Yes. The narcissist similarly has no existence in the absence of merging and fusing with outside voices. The narcissist has no self, actually has no self and no ego. That's the irony. Mm -hmm. Narcissists are, are often called or confuted with egotists. They don't have an ego. That's mm -hmm. precisely the problem. Mm. And because they don't have an ego, in other words, they don't have the regulatory agency that instructs a human being as to what is acceptable and not acceptable and what are the consequences of his actions in the world. Narcissists don't have this. So what they have to do, they have to outsource these functions. They apply, they supplicate, they, they beg, they coerce, they cajole others to give them the kind of input and feedback which will allow them to form an opinion of themselves and of the world around them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, the narcissist mind is a hive mind. It's a collage, it's a kaleidoscope. It's a, an amalgamation of thousands of inputs and feedbacks on a minute, second by second basis. And then there is no integration of these voices. It's another problem. Because there is, a, no, there is no controlling self. There's no controlling executive, as we call it in psychology. Right. The, there's no integration of these voices. So they compete. Within the narcissist, there's a constant state of dissonance, which explains why the narcissist is so compulsive and so obsessive and so demanding and so unaware of other people's uh, existence as three-dimensional beings. He is so preoccupied in trying to create, to generate an identity core by, by kind of reconciling all these voices, that he has no time for empathy or for any other outward or object-related functions. This is very similar to the situation in borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. In borderline personality disorder, we have something called identity diffusion. Right. It's when the, the, the borderline, person with borderline does not have an identity core. She shifts, I'm saying she because most borderlines are women. She right. shifts and, and changes everything. Values, opinions, preferences, wishes, needs, uh, loved ones, hated ones. Mechanisms such as splitting um, mm. um, render some people idealized and the next day or the next minute devalued. So there's no stability, no continuity, no constancy, both in the inner landscape of the narcissist and in the inner landscape of borderline. And of course, no wonder that many borderlines are grandiose. Mm -hmm. Because, and with this I will finish this extremely long answer, <laughs> because grandiosity is a way, it's a, it's a narrative, it's a coalescing narrative. It's a narrative that allows the narcissist and the borderline to interpret the world to organize the world. So it's an organizing principle. In this sense, grandiosity is a cognitive deficit. It, it impacts the narcissist's ability and the borderline's ability to perceive reality properly. It's a filter, kind of, and it's a model of the world. It's what we call a theory of mind or a theory of the world. Mm -hmm. it's, a model, it's a model of the world which is highly unrealistic. It, it, it creates an impaired reality testing, but, but, the narcissist needs this narrative. He needs this script, this unifying script, because otherwise, it, uh, it will be it will be a horror movie. It's otherwise it's terrorizing because if you don't have this unifying principle, if you don't have this narrative strand, the world does not make sense. It's meaningless. It's confusing when you 
look at a narcissist and they seem to be a person. There seems to be something there. That's if, if you know what I'm saying. But what you're saying is that there isn't a real, there is no sense of identity that it's changing all the time. Um, I think that's what you're saying. Yes, I'm saying that the narcissist is a classic shapeshifter. And, and one of the reasons narcissists believe themselves to be the next step in the evolutionary <laughs> ladder yes. is because truly, truly, they are easily comparable to artificial intelligence, to extraterrestrials, to shapeshifters, and so on. A, the narcissist puts on a great simulation of a human being. Hmm. In 1970, there was a roboticist, um, Japanese roboticist, of course, hmm. Masahiro Mori. Hmm. And Mori's, Mori coined the, the phrase uncanny valley. Hmm. He suggested that as robots become more and more human-like, as they become more and more humanoid, people will feel less and less comfortable with them, yes. will, feel, will feel more discomfort yes. when confronted with them. Yes. The narcissist is exactly this. It's a humanoid, a humanoid robot. It's a simulation. It's a it's computer simulation externalized or projected or holographed or whatever. It, it, and it's it's done to perfection, almost to perfection. There's something missing. There's a kind of off-key note somewhere in the background. Mm. And people feel that and they feel very uncomfortable when they're in the presence of narcissists, but they cannot say why. And, and the reason is that. As Kernberg noted in 1975, he preceded me <laughs> by some years, <laughs> Kernberg, Kernberg suggested that at the core of narcissists and, and borderlines, there's an emptiness, a void, yes. deep space. Mm. I evolved this concept a bit and I, I'm suggesting the concept of a hall of mirrors. Yeah. <clears throat> I yeah. think the narcissist is a kind of hall of mirrors, which would explain the narcissist's ability to get intimate partners addicted to him. Yes. The narcissist in, in, inexorable and, and amazingly potent, amazingly powerful hold over intimate partners. In other words, it, it's a good explanation for, for the reasons for trauma bonding with the narcissist. Mm. And the whole of mirror simply states that mm. when you're trying to interact with the narcissist, the narcissist puts up a carnival sort of hall of mirrors. Mm. And then what you are what you're interacting mm. with actually is an idealized image of yourself. Yeah. So the narcissist idealizes you and then invites you inside, invites you into his hall of mirrors. And the narcissist extends this invitation by exposing for a minute his in his inner his true his true self, the wounded child inside him. Yeah. No, no woman can resist this. No man. This is a call. No man too. And, and, <laughs> and many men. And many a men. Yes, if they're empathic. <laughs> so uh, it's a call. It's a, it's a primordial call. Um, yeah. We we all of us men and women, you know, we we tend to be very protective of children, especially wounded, tortured, and traumatized children. Mm. We we tend to you know afford. We tend to afford succor. We tend to love them. We tend to shield them. So this is precisely the sequence. The narcissist exposes his inner tormented, tortured, traumatized, crying child. The intimate partner gets hooked. And then the narcissist withdraws this child and instead presents, puts forward a hall of mirrors. At that stage, the intimate partner falls in love with her reflection. But not with her true reflection, obviously, with her idealized reflection. Mm. And for many of the intimate partners of narcissists, this is the first time in their lives that they experience self-love. Yeah. Many, many of these intimate partners are actually traumatized codependents yeah. or borderline, borderline women mm. or otherwise damaged, broken and wounded people. And so for, for the majority of the lives of these potential intimate partners, they didn't experience, they didn't have a chance to experience self-love. Yeah. Actually, many of them are self-loathing, yeah. self-destructive. Yeah. And so the narcissist for the first time allows them to fall in love with their own reflection. In other words, with themselves. Yeah. Now look at the irony. What the narcissist does to his intimate partners is actually to convert them into narcissists. 
because they fall in love with their own idealized reflection, mm. which is precisely, which is a very good definition of mm. the narcissistic psychodynamic. Mm. The narcissist falls in love with his own idealized grandiose reflection. Mm. And he does this to his intimate partners. He idealizes them and then he lets them fall in love with their idealized image. He infects, he's contagious. Mm. He's a, narcissism is a pandemic. Mm. And the virus is the narcissist in this sense. And he's contagious and he exactly like the virus. Viruses use the cellular mechanisms yeah. to replicate. They need a host. And narcissists, narcissists are doing the same. Mm. Mm. They invade your mind and they use it to replicate. They replicate by converting you into a narcissist. And it's small wonder that there are so many comparisons online between narcissists and vampires. <laughs> va vampires do the same exactly. They infect you by biting your neck, you know? So you see, that's the reason for the fascination with narcissism, because it taps into so many archetypes yeah. in both ancient archetypes and future, futuristic archetypes, science fiction archetypes. And it, it's, it combines, it's a bridge between past and future. It's, narcissism is a hell of a lot more than a mental health disorder. It's a metaphor for our times. Mm. It's, it captures perfectly our civilization. Sam, have you seen an exception where a, a narcissistic personality disorder is formed or there's uh, with psychopathy, where there has not been abuse in childhood in whatever form? Have you ever seen no. an exception to that? No, just to just yeah. to clarify, yeah. most people make the mistake of believing that my work is autobiographical, mm -hmm. that I'm describing myself. Sure. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm the father of the field. I I was the first to discuss narcissism online in nineteen ninety five. Yeah. And for well over <laughs> ten years I've been the only the only one. The, my website has been the only website and my support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse have been the only support groups. So during this period and much and to this very day, I have amassed a database of 1,736, as of yesterday, people diagnosed officially with narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. I then, and they volunteered, of course, yes. So I then administered to them a test of 687 questions known as the MMPI-2. It's a personality test that cannot be faked mm. because it has protections, inbuilt protections, mm. fake uh, wrong questions, misleading questions, all kinds of things like that. So mm. you can easily find out what the person is like. Yes. And so I've administered to all of them this test and I have a database which is by far the largest in the world. For you to understand, the biggest, the biggest studies ever conducted on narcissists by Twenge and Campbell these studies included 30 people, three zero. My database has 1,700 people. Hmm. So my work is based on that. And therefore, therefore, I can provide authoritative answers about literally any dimension of narcissism. And my answers are much more authoritative than anyone else's. And so I can tell you with authority, there is not a single case that I've come across of a narcissist, <clears throat> don't, conf don't confuse this with a psychopath, of a narcissist that is not the, out the said outcome um, of, of childhood abuse. It's different for psychopaths. Psychopathy in all likelihood is actually a brain disorder. Mm -hmm. We have overwhelming evidence that the physiology and the neuroscience of psychopaths is, I'm saying we because I, I teach neuroscience and psychiatry. I'm mm. a professor in neuroscience and psychiatry. Yes. So I allow myself to use we. <laughs> so we have we have overwhelming evidence that the physiology and neuroscience of psychopaths is substantially different to that of normal people. So substantially different that you know you might as well say they're different species. For example, they don't sweat yeah. when they are when they are exposed to certain stimuli. Their skin conductance, electrical charge in the skin, remains absolutely the same, mm. regardless of circumstances. Mm. They do not have a fear reaction. They are fearless. Not because they are courageous. They simply don't have a fear reaction. Yeah. 
the activity in their amygdala, the, the part of the brain that regulates emotions and so on, is so massively different that you might as well, as I said, be looking at another species. So it does seem that psychopathy, true psychopathy, by the way, because we need to dis differentiate true psychopathy from antisocial personalities. Right. But it seems that a true psychopath is simply an accident of nature, which is exactly what the father of the field of psychopathy, Cleckley, Cleckley and, and, uh, and Cartman suggested in the 1940s, Cleckley in his famous masterpiece, The Mask of Sanity, mm. which, by the way, which, by the way, is available for download freely online. Mm. So in The Mask of Sanity, Cleckley was the first to suggest that psychopathy is so alien that it must be a brain disorder. And he was right. He's, he didn't say it's a brain disorder. He said it's a biological, biological problem. And he was right. Hmm. Sandy, the other thing I wanted to, and you've mentioned this um, in, in some of your recent seminars, <clears throat> is the aspect of, uh, of addiction with codependents and with narcissists. Um, I think, uh, and I'd be interested in what you have to say, that codependents and narcissists are cut from the same cloth. We just take different trajectories. But what's interesting to me is that a lot of narcissists have addictions that proves that narcissists have feelings because addiction is all about changing how we feel about ourselves. And the codependents have addictions too. And what I think is, is really not, uh, I, I mean, for example, the condition of love addiction, which only came to the fore, I think, about 40 years ago, uh, the first 12-step group was formed for love addiction. I think a lot of codependents don't understand the addictive dynamic between, uh, between the, the, the codependent and the narcissist. So I'd be interested to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, one of the functions of addiction is mood regulation. Yeah. That's true. And no one has ever claimed to the best of, no one serious has ever claimed to the best of my knowledge that narcissists don't have moods. They're actually very moody. And in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition five, the latest edition published, in 2013, mm. uh, narcissism uh, now officially includes a mood dimension. Yeah. So, so they they describe dysphoria, depression, and as, as an integral part of narcissism. So, which I've been suggesting for well over 30 years. Mm. I I 25 years. I I absolutely think that narcissism could be amply described as a depressive disorder, mm. if you wish to do so. Mm -hmm. So there is a mood, um, an issue of mood dysregulation, which is of course very common in mood lability. is very common, for example, in borderlines. Mm. And so that's one thing. Second thing, it's not true that narcissists don't have emotions. <laughs> yeah. There's no su there's no such thing as a human being without <laughs> emotions. Even psychopaths have emotions. Yeah. The the thing is that narcissists repress their emotions. They have no access to their emotions, and the reason is very simple. There's a lot of pain there. There's a lot of hurt. And they are afraid that if they touch upon their emotions, they will disintegrate and become suicidal, which most of them do, for example, in certain settings in therapy. So borderlines don't have this defense mechanism. There was a guy, um, the, the, one, of, one of the researchers of borderlines suggested that borderline personality disorder is a failed attempt at narcissism. Mm. And this is, this is the source of the phrase failed narcissism. Mm. People, people confuse failed narcissist and collapsed narcissist. Mm. A failed, failed narcissism is a phase in the development of borderline personality disorder. A collapsed narcissist is a narcissist who failed at obtaining narcissistic supply. Mm. So there's a, a, a big difference between the two. At any rate, the narcissist succeeds with the borderlines, with borderline fails. The narcissist succeeds to firewall his emotions. Mm. He succeeds to isolate his emotions so that he has no further access to them. And the borderline fails in doing this. And because the borderline fails in doing this, the borderline experiences raw, powerful, overwhelming emotions all the time. And that's why 10% of borderlines commit suicide successfully. Mm. I mean, the emotions in a borderline are like, are like permanent tsunami. They are constantly drowning in their emotions. And this is precisely what the narcissist is terrified of. That's why the narcissist walls off his emotions. But 
even though the narcissist keeps his emotions at bay, the negative emotions are allowed to surface mm -hmm. because they have a survival value. Mm -hmm. So narcissists, for example, can and do get very angry. That's narcissistic rage. Yes. Narcissists are envious and so on. These are emotions, obviously. And to regulate these emotions as well as the mood, narcissists have a high co co uh, dual diagnosis. Yeah. In other words, narcissists very often abuse substances, for example, mm. the reckless, reckless uh, driving, mm. uh, pathological gambling, shopaholism, and of course, workaholism. Workaholism is very prevalent among narcissists. Mm. Now, narcissism is an addiction. <laughs> By definition, it's an addiction to narcissistic supply. And, um, and therefore, the, the very question uh, of whether narcissists are, uh, have, have addictions is wrongly phrased. Narcissists are addicts. Huh. Their narcissism is their addiction. This is, it's, in a, it's an addictive personality disorder. It's the ultimate in addiction. Yes, it's the ultimate addiction because their addiction regulates their being, their existence, regulates their identity, regulates who they are, not only what they feel, which is the normal addict, the normal addict, the alcoholic, the drug abuser, they regulate how they feel. The narcissist uses his addictions, including substance abuse and so on, to regulate who he is, mm. not how he feels, but who he is, mm. his identity. Mm. Now, the same goes for the, for the codependent. Yeah. The codependent is an addict, of course. Mm. He is addicted to a significant other. Yeah. The codependent is a private case of a narcissist in this sense. <laughs> the narcissist is dependent on hundreds of others, on thousands of others, on millions of others, if he's a politician. Yeah. The, the codependent is addicted to one person. But it's only a matter of degree and quantity. Qualitatively, these are both addictions that regulate internal the internal dynamics and the inner landscape of the person. Mm. Now, the emphasis is different. The narcissist emphasis is cognitive. The narcissistic supply is a cognitive supply. Mm. And, uh, uh, and the narcissist uses a form of empathy, which I dubbed cold empathy, which is essentially cognitive empathy. As, to, opposed, as opposed to emotional empathy, warm empathy. As opposed to full-fledged empathy, yeah. which is reflexive, cognitive and emotional. Right. Um, narcissist uses cold empathy to scan people around him, to isolate, to find, to ascertain who could be a source of supply and then to extract supply. So supply in this case is totally cognitive. The codependent supply mm. is emotional, mm. not cognitive. And it is true that uh, codependents and narcissists have identical developmental trajectories. They are exposed to the same triggers and stimuli <coughs> in childhood. Mm. They're exposed to abuse in both developmental pathways that aforementioned. And they make different choices. The narcissist chooses to emulate, to become his abuser. And the codependent chooses to merge with the abuser. Because the codependent believes, <laughs> unconsciously, that merging and fusing with the abuser would allow her to control the abuse. Obviously, if you are one with the abuser, Whatever is happening to you is under your control mm. because you are the one abusing yourself from that point on. Mm. And, and the narcissist becomes an abuser, counter abusers. And in this sense, narcissists are what we call counter dependents. Mm. So actually, we have two forces at play, co-dependence and counter dependence. <clears throat> one of the manifestations of which is narcissism and another manifestation is psychopathy. So whether you become the abu an abuser or whether you become the abuser, these are the two choices you face as a child. Now, luckily, the vast majority of children, the overwhelming vast majority, just to be clear, um, survive abuse. And throughout their lives, they, they're totally normal and healthy people. It's a tiny minority, a very tiny minority, who adopt um, unconsciously, who adopt the, um, the less healthy trajectories of narcissism and codependence. Sam, are you saying that narcissism is a choice? Well, to some extent it is. 
obviously, when you're a child, because typically narcissism evolves between the ages of four and nine. Obviously, at this at this age, you are you are not autonomous enough, um, even objectively, you're not autonomous enough to to make choices of any kind. Mm. Uh, but there is one realm, realm in which you are king, even though you are four year old, mm. even though as a four even as a four year old, there's one realm which is which is totally under your control, and that is your internal um, internal your mind. Yeah? Mm. No one can touch your mind. When you talk to torture victims, mm. victims who've been tortured in, in various dictatorial and authoritarian regimes, they keep telling you they, they touched my body, they destroyed my body, but they couldn't touch my free thinking, yes. my mind. Yes. Yes. It's, it's the same with the, with the narcissist. Uh, as a child, the narcissist's body is tortured. Uh, there's, there are attempts to invade his mind mm. via psychological abuse and verbal abuse. Mm. But the child's refuge, sanctuary city, only refuge and only shelter is within himself. Mm. So the child withdraws, withdraws in, inwards, and establishes a citadel, a fortress, uh, impregnable and impermeable to, to the outside. And in order to cope with the, with the demands of reality and in order to interact with other people, his abusers included, he creates a, an imaginary friend, and that imaginary friend is everything the child is not. The child is helpless. This imaginary friend is omnipotent. The child cannot predict the future because adults around him are narcissistic or unpredictable or crazy making. Or, so the imaginary friend is omniscient, knows everything. Yeah. The, the child is, is told consistently that he is a bad, unworthy object or that he is des deserving of love only conditionally. Mm. The imaginary friend is perfection, is a perfect being. And of course, immediately it springs to mind that the imaginary friend is God. Mm. It's, it's omnipotent, omniscient, perfect, that's God. It's a good description of God. Spinoza would have agreed. Mm. So it's a good description of God. And in this sense, what the child creates at age four is a religion. The child comes up with a private religion where there is an, a god, a godlike figure, a divinity, and the child worships this divinity. He allows this divinity to intercede on his behalf with the outside world and with his abusers. And it's a decoy. All the pain, all the hurt, the, the false self, the name of this imaginary friend is a false self. Yeah. All the pain and the hurt reside with the false self. The false self firewalls the child. The child is one step removed from all the vagaries of life, from all the, the, the torture that is in torment that is inflicted upon him. And so the, it, it has a decoy function. But this is, this is actually also the function, for example, of the church. It's an intermediary mm. between us and God. Mm. So yeah. it's a private religion. And there's one worshiper, that's a child, and there's one divinity, that's the false self, this imaginary friend. And of course, like in every religion, there's also human sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And the human sacrifice here is the true self. Yeah. The child strikes a Faustian deal with a false self. The false self is very demonic, is very devil-like, satanic in a way. So the child strikes a Faustian deal with this entity, with this divine entity. The child says, listen, I will sacrifice myself to you, but you protect me. Yeah. You not only protect me, you make me great. You make me overwhelmingly great. You make me infinitely great. And that's, these are the root causes of grandiosity. So this is the deal. That the, this is the Faustian deal that the, 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 the narcissist has to, has to live with for the rest of his life. Because this, that he, he strikes this deal when he's four. But it's still absolutely valid when he's 40. A, a, a deal with the devil, Sam? You said it's almost demonic? Well, the false self is, is, a, is a kind of... I said it's a Faustian deal. You can't strike a Faustian deal with, with God. Yeah. Right? Um, so, it's the, so it's a Faustian deal. The child sacrifices his true self. In other words, the child sacrifices himself. He sacrifices his soul. 
to this false self, this divine entity. And that would mean that this divine entity is devilish. It's like the devil in, you know, in the, the middle, middle Ages or in Gesser's work. Yeah. And Sam, the, um, the, I know you're doing work with, uh, with cold therapy, I think, where you're treating uh, people um, as narcissists, as children, not as adults. You said that's one of the problems with traditional therapy with narcissists, which makes a lot of sense. But how come before your work, there has not been a cure for narcissism per se? I have no idea, honestly. Hmm. Seriously. I mean, I am shocked that no one realized that Nazi, no one had realized that Nazis are actually children. Everyone admits throughout the literature that narcissism is a case of arrested development. Yeah. Everyone says long before me that narcissism is a, is a dysfunctional form of attachment, mm. which is attachment is, is formed in childhood, not later. Yeah. So everyone admits um, from the earliest thinking about narcissism, starting with Freud in 1914-15. You know, it's the earliest thinking on narcissism, Hornai, Kohut, I mean, everyone says that narcissism is a childhood affliction. Mm. And yet no one, not a single theorist, theoretician, not a single therapist or practitioner ever thought about the simple idea that if narcissism is a case of arrested development and mm. there is a trapped child inside, we yeah. need to use child yeah. psychology. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm pretty shocked by this uh, by this omission. It's and I think it's telling. I think it's telling because you know for a very very long time child abuse was a taboo topic. Mm. Like you couldn't really talk about sexual abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse. Mm. Freud was castigated and, and penalized in effect. For, for daring to talk about the role of children and child abuse in the family, in the middle class family. And I, well, until the 70s, the, the topic of child abuse was, mm. was taboo. Mm. And then when we did finally grudgingly, begr grudgingly started to tackle the topic of, of child abuse within a men's castle, you know, within, within the home unit, mm. the household unit, uh, we did it in a very haphazard and circumspect manner. We, we didn't really attack the problem head on. And, and to this very day, it's a, so I think that's the first reason. The second reason, I think um, we are terrified to admit that appearances are not substance. Mm. Our entire society is based on signaling, mm. on signals. When we see an adult, we would, we would feel very unsafe I mean, if, if I were to tell you that some adults are not adults, you would feel very unsafe <laughs> because mm. you wouldn't know how to trust people, who, who you can trust and with what. Uh, we are we're utterly based on signaling. There is a fallacy, there is a cognitive, cognitive deficit, cognitive bias called base rate, base rate deficit or base rate die, uh, bias. We discovered in studies, including very recent studies by Dana Rielli and others, we discovered that people believe in face value 95% of all statements immediately, uncritically, without checking anything, without talking to anyone, immediately accept 95% of everything they're told, however outlandish. Mm. And this is well documented. It's called the base rate. You can look it up. Mm. And so people need to trust them to believe. If we undermine the foundation of trust, if we undermine the value of signaling, we are undermining actually our social contract and our ability to operate in teams and cooperatives. Mm. We undermine the, the foundations of the success of our species. So I'm actually doing exactly this by claiming that some adults are not what they seem. Mm. I'm actually saying signaling sucks. Yeah. You cannot trust people. It's deceptive. It's subversive. <laughs> it's a subversive message mm. because it says you can't trust what you see. Mm. Mm. You are mm. seeing an adult, but it's not an adult. Mm. It's the same like saying, listen, some people are inherently evil and malicious, but you can't identify them. I'm not giving you any tool to discern who is evil and malicious. I'm just telling you some people are evil and malicious. Mm. Mm. Imagine the impact is going to have on you. 
And we are facing this with a pandemic, with COVID-19, because we are being told there's something in the air that's going to kill you. But we are not given tools to identify this something. Look at the impact this did, this had. Look, it destroyed our civilization, literally. So saying some people are malicious and evil, some people are children, but there is no way to tell who these people are, is exactly like saying there's a virus in the air and it's going to kill you, but there's no way to tell where it is. I, I, you know, Sam, personally, <clears throat> um, I didn't know the person I was with was a, was a female covert somatic narcissist, but my instinct told me to get away. And that's what I did. Um, but what I, and you talk about this a lot in your seminars as well. Um, the people that I, in my experience, I see so few people, codependents, leaving narcissists and so few. And you've said yourself, and I'm going to quote you, it's a big, big problem. What are your thoughts on that, Sam? Well, everything is a choice. And choices reflect needs. Mm. When the codependent remains with the narcissist, she remains because the narcissist caters to very profound needs that mm. she has. Mm. And because no one else can do it better. He's the best, he's the best provider, he's the best practice provider. And she realizes this. She had tried so-called normals or neurotypical people before. She had tried, I don't know, psychopaths. She tried, and she settles on the narcissist because he does the work best. The problem is that her needs are pathologized. Yeah. So it is wrong to focus on separating the codependent from the narcissist. It's, it's much better, much more profitable, much more appropriate to tackle the pathology, the fact that her needs are pathological. Yeah. And to try to, to somehow tackle these needs. Um, by the way, this is something we do very successfully. For example, borderline personality disorder, which is a form of codependency in a way. Mm. Borderline personality disorder. We have a, an exceedingly successful therapy, possibly the second most successful after CBT. And that's dialectical behavior therapy, DBT. DPT is very successful with borderlines. Within one year, 50% of borderlines lose their disorder. So what is more profitable, to try to separate the borderline from her much needed uh, narcissist, or to try to get rid of her borderline personality disorder so that she no longer needs him? Right. Right. I think the emphasis is wrong, because today we are focusing on, on teaching, um, teaching intimate partners of narcissists either how to cope with them, one way or another, survival strategies, manipulative strategies, and so on, or to go no, or to go no contact. In other, in other words, how to separate from them. I invented all these strategies, bar one. The only one I did not invent was Grey Rock, <laughs> which is a wonderful strategy, by the way. <laughs> and my only regret, I should have come up with it, <laughs> um, but I did. But I invented all the rest. I invented mirroring. I invented, invented no contact. I invented all, all these techniques, and yet I'm saying that it is this is the wrong focus. The focus should not be on the narcissist. The narcissist is a symptom akin to, temp to fever, akin to temperature. Yes. It's a fever. The, narcissist, the fact that you have a narcissist in your life says that something is wrong with you, not as a, not as a value judgment, not that something is wrong with you morally, yeah. but it, mean, it means there's some dynamics in you, some psychological dynamics in you are problematic, and you need a problematic person to cater to them. It, it, it's it's almost like uh, the 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 focus that I see with people who are still in narcissistic relationships. The focus is all on the narcissist, and I admit the same thing happened to me. But now what I do is I focus on the work that I need to do on myself, and I, I, I and I own that. I think that's very very important because you've also said numerous times, uh, stop uh, uh, demonizing the, uh, the 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 narcissist. You, you've said that on a number of occasions. Yes, because uh, people are converting this into a morality play, you know, mm. good versus evil, mm. Mm. the devil versus God. I don't know what, I mean, it's, it's totally out of control, this whole thing. 
I, I, it's a it's a it's a defective problematic human being that you're living with and you need to work on yourself so that you don't need this person anymore in your life it, it's kind of like alcoholism sam that um, alcoholism is the tip of the iceberg at what what lies beneath that alcohol isn't really the problem it's the same sort of thing yes exactly and and i actually suggest in, in the new in new work that i'm doing i, I branched out i'm not dealing with other personality disorders with addiction so so I came up with a new theory of addiction, which is making the rounds right now. And in my new theory of addiction, addiction is actually the natural state. It's actually a healthy, natural state. It's just when addiction combines with mental health disorders that it gets out of control and mm -hmm. hampers functioning and, and happiness. Mm -hmm. But I asked the very, the very simple question, which again, to my utter shock, no one has ever asked. If addiction is an abnormal state, if it's a pathological state, why 42% of, of our brain are de is dedicated to addiction? 42% mm. mm. of all the structures and surfaces of our brain are uh, dedicated to fostering, to creating addiction, and then to processing the outcomes of addiction. Why would our brain be built this way if addiction was the wrong thing for us? Mm. It's the same like saying 10% of our brain is dedicating to thinking, but thinking is pathological. Hmm. Nature, nature never, nature is parsimonious, never invents structures hmm. uh, that are not necessary. Addiction has, ve has multiple very crucial and very beneficial functions, function, functions, and, but when it combines with mental health disorders, it becomes alcoholism. Or substance abuse or love addiction or sex addiction or internet addiction we get addicted to the most unbelievable things addiction is a mode of relating relating to the world yeah to anything in the world it's not true that there is something inherent in alcohol that makes you addicted no. this whole theory that alcohol is a brain disorder is <laughs> sheer unmitigated nonsense <laughs> alcohol has obviously effects on the brain but it also has an effect effects on the liver. Would you say it's a liver disorder? Of course not. <laughs> mm. It's alcoholism. Alcoholism. The use of alcohol for addiction is is simply um, an environmental choice. By the way, when we cure the alcoholism, the person gets addicted to sex. When you cure the sex addiction, it's, the same it, person it, it, gets addicted to pornography. It's I mean, it's cross addiction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it's addiction is a state of being. Yes. not a particular choice of the addictive substance or circumstance or people or whatever. What do you say, Sam, to, uh, um, I mean, you, you, you came up with a no contact. I, I personally did that uh, and it was quite difficult because uh, I think if, if, if a person doesn't understand hoovering, for example, that you think that the narcissist is coming back because he or she loves you. And of course, that's not the case. So my choice was at the time to say absolutely no contact. Um, what is your, what, what are your thoughts there, Sam, uh, in terms of breaking off or getting free from the narcissistic relationship? All the other strategies, the seven I invented, the one I hadn't invented, all of them are far inferior and honestly counterproductive, far mm. inferior to no contact. Mm. No contact is the only viable, healthy strategy. Here's how to convince yourself to go no contact. <laughs> if you understand and realize that the narcissist is not a malevolent, vicious entity, not a demon, but a child, simply a child, yeah. it would be far easier for you to go no contact. Because your expectations of a relationship are adult expectations, even as a codependent, but yeah. your expectations are adult expectations. Yeah. Even the codependent, for example, expects empathy and compassion and affection and comfort. You know? mm. So you have adult expectations, but if you realize that the target of your expectations is a child, you would let go. You would let go. Now, some people say, when I propose this, this way of thinking, some people say it's even more difficult to let go of a child than to let go of an adult. Yeah. Well, that depends. 
if you have a if your state of mind is such that your maternal or paternal instincts are misdirected to that extent you have to work on it right. then something is missing in your life right right for example real children maybe if you have such a need to parent it's either because you were forced to parent as a child mm. you were parentified mm. or because you want to parent right now as an adult and you didn't come around to it. <laughs> Don't marry a child. Make one. <laughs> it's interesting, Sam, because I had that experience with the narcissist. I saw, I saw a child there. I did not see an adult. I get that completely. I saw that. Um, Sam, there was something else that you said as well um, in one of your, again, your recent um, um, interviews where you were describing narcissistic comp decompensation as being absolutely uh, terrifying for the narcissist. I think you even made reference to one of Salvador Dali's paintings. Uh, yeah. Could you sort of, because in other words, that the it's difficult for codependents to understand, but the, the whole principle of that the narcissist is only interested in narcissistic supply. Uh, so the narcissist doesn't see us as people. They have batteries to be thrown away or toasters or computers. So it's only for narcissistic supply. And then when they do not have that supply, that decompensation, maybe you could elaborate there? Yeah, sure. Well, it's not necessarily that the narcissist doesn't see other people as people. He sees them as service providers, mm -hmm. as you would see, for example, an electrician. You know, mm. he sees them as service providers. They are supposed to provide narcissistic supply. The narcissistic supply is needed for the simple fact that in the absence of narcissistic supply, the narcissist is blind, deaf, and dumb. Mm. Narcissist has no reality testing. He has no access to reality, and he has no ability to self-assess, to evaluate himself. He needs people to tell him constantly, this is who you are, this is how you are. These are your boundaries. This is where you're, what you're good at, and so on and so forth. And this is reality, and you should not do this, or you should do this. He needs this constant input. This input, this kind of inputs, are generated from the inside in healthy people mm. by what Freud called the ego. Mm. The narcissist doesn't have this, so he needs this constant input from the outside, not only to buttress his. Uh, inflated fantastic grandiosity, but simply to survive, to realize what is what, who is who, what can and cannot be done, and what would be the consequences, harmful or other, uh, of his actions. He needs people because he's blind. He needs a guiding, a guide dog, if mm. you wish. Mm. And people are, are his guide dog. Now, in the absence of narcissistic supply, the narcissist is groping in the dark in a room full of razor blades. So if there's a room, it's full with knives and razor, razor blades, and he's groping in absolute pitch darkness in this room. Can you imagine how terrifying this is? Gradually, all his defense mechanisms shut down. They shut down because defense mechanisms rely crucially on input from, from the environment. What defense mechanisms do, they process input from the environment. Mm -hmm. They reframe it so that it's not egodystonic. In other words, they take inputs from the environment, they change it a bit so that you feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And this is what the main role of defense mechanisms, uh, all of them, by the way. But when the narcissist, because the narcissist has no access to information from the environment, all these defense mechanisms shut down, stop working. At that point, he is in direct contact with the razor blades and the knife. Sure. And he is constantly cut. Uh, cut again and again. Some some of these are paper cuts. Some of them are very deep, life-threatening cuts. And this is the process of decompensation. And so at some point, the narcissist bolts out of this metaphorical room. And that's what we call acting out. The narcissist bolts out of the room by either, either resorting to reckless, self-endangering, self-destructive acts, it's kind of, mm. if I if I annihilate myself, I will not be cut anymore. Mm. Or by destroying the room, which is much more frequently what, the, what narcissists do. So they destroy their marriages, their businesses, their nations, if they are politicians, Adolf Hitler. I mean, so either of these two, because 
If you take someone like Adolf Hitler, mm. his main problem in the last two years of his rule was narcissistic supply. Mm. He was not as revered and as admired as before. He was beginning to fail. Mm. And so ultimately he gave direct instructions to his ministry, Minister of Industry, Albert Speer, to destroy Germany, to, to simply to destroy all railways, all hospitals, <laughs> all cities in Germany, yeah. to destroy this room, mm. to destroy this metaphorical room, which keeps hurting him and, and so on. So this is, this is the process. Uh, the process is unimaginable to someone who is not a Nazis. It feels a lot like, uh, let's say, amputation by millimeter. Mm. Like you are being amputated millimeter by millimeter, sliced, like mm. salami, mm. millimeter by millimeter. And having to watch this happen. And none of this can be put back together. There's a feeling, a feeling of doom, because you, the narcissist is convinced when this, when this is happening, that the process is irre irreversible, which is wrong, by the way. The minute it gets supply, <sighs> everything is put, is put back together. Mm. Mm. This is the glue. Supply is the glue that holds everything together. But mm. when when it is happening, um, it's it's harrowing and and absolutely terrifying. I mean, it's, it's a horror movie. It's a nightmare that you cannot wake up from. It, the same process happens with borderline personality disorder mm. when they are rejected or abandoned. Mm. Mm. When when people with borderline personality disorder are actually rejected or abandoned, or they anticipate rejection and abandonment. They go through an identical process. The process is so identical that I think abandonment and rejection is the equivalent of deficient narcissistic supply. Hmm. So I think actually in the borderline psychodynamic and borderline psychological landscape, relationships with other people, with, with their so-called significant other, is narcissistic supply. I think that's why borderlines keep failing in their relationships. Because it's not a real relationship. It's a narcissistic supply in the form of a human being. And in this sense, of course, borderlines are codependents. Sam, the, if we use the, <clears throat> the somatic narcissist as an example, if one looked at it from the outside, we would say, for example, he or she is promiscuous. But it's not about the sex, is it? It's about narcissistic supply. <laughs> Yes, sex is a mode of communication. You can you can commun you can use uh, sex to communicate a power matrix or, or power ratios. So many people use sex to overpower other people and to establish a hierarchy. Mm. For example, in prison, in prison, sex is used among men yeah. to establish a hierarchy, mm. even if these men are utterly heterosexual. Mm. You know? mm. uh, rape is rape is not about sex. There's not a single sexual element in, in rape. It's all about power. Um, sexual assault is, is a combination of, of uh, power and, and, and liberty, freedom, unbridled freedom. So sex is, is simply a language. It's a language. And that's why we are perfectly capable of having sex with emotions, sex without emotions, and sometimes switch between the two on the same, the same day. Hmm. So, so if, sex is a, if sex is a language, we need to ask ourselves what is the somatic narcissist trying to say with sex? Well, to him, sex, not the sex itself, but two elements in the sex constitute narcissistic supply. First of all, the chase and the conquest. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is the performance. So somatic narcissist, ironically, would be very concerned with how much pleasure they are giving their partner. Mm. So they would, for example, ask the partner how many orgasms she has had, mm. how many times she has orgasmed. And they keep like a ledger, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they would, they, so they are, it's very ironic, by the way. Somatic narcissists are um, focused on pyrotechnics, the pyrotechnics of sex. And in many ways, sex with them is highly mechanical. Yes. But, but they are concerned with the effects the sex has on their partners, because this is the only objective measure of success. So the somatic narcissist sex is about performance and success. 
in both in both fields, conquest and actual intercourse. Do they somatic narcissists enjoy sex then? No. Exactly like histrionic women. We have numerous studies that show that histrionic women, histrionic women are the women who are up, who are overly seductive, overly flirtatious, hypersex, hypersexed in mm. some cases, not in all cases, but mm. hypersex in some cases. They're the kind of women who steal other women's husbands, you know, this kind of thing. Mm. So we have numerous studies that show that histrionic uh, women are actually what used to be called frigid women. They are women who absolutely abhor and detest sex. Mm. They are not interested in sex at all. And yet they dedicate an inordinate amount of time to their appearance, to seduction, to flirtation, to teasing, and to ultimate intercourse. And so both the somatic narcissist and the histrionic woman, women, uh, woman, they're both not interested in sex. It has nothing to do with sex, nor do they enjoy sex at all. For example, a somatic narcissist would never enjoy sex in an intimate relationship. And a somatic narcissist would have um, erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation with a woman who would show interest in him. Mm. Mm. A woman who would, who would initiate the sex mm. because he needs to conquer. Mm. It's a power element. He needs, he needs the success and the performance and the power. So if a woman were to come to a somatic narcissist, and pick him up, initiate, um, come on to him. Uh, he is very likely to perform very poorly, if at all. Sam, do narcissists know what what they're doing? And in other words, before you answer, you you said something again recently that really interested me. You spoke about the difference between awareness and insight. So an awareness for me can be, I know that I'm doing something, but the insight means I'm able to travel inside and say, what is this thing in me? So that was an interesting point that you made. So do they know when they're doing these things, whether they're cerebral or somatic, do they know what they're doing? Of course they know what they're doing. <laughs> Very few of them are retards. <laughs> they, they know what they're doing, of course. The distinction between awareness or self-awareness, more precisely, and uh, an insight is not mine, it's Freud's. Freud said that it's not enough to know what you're doing. Mm. If you want to affect change, you need an emotional reaction to what you do. Right. For example, if, you, if you're doing something and then you feel that it's wrong, your conscience, your superego in, in Freud's terms, mm. uh, you know it's wrong, then you're not likely to do it again. So it affected change. The emotion yeah. attached to your action affected change. And right. that's, that's the insight. Right. Insight also has to do with understanding yourself, who you are, your identity, your, your inner processes and so on. Mm. Now, narcissists are fully aware of what they're doing. They are fully aware of the distinction between right and wrong. And that's the reason narcissism is not accepted, like, with exception of one case. Um, narcissism has never been accepted as a, a mitigating defense in, in case of crimes. Right. So it's not a not guilty by reason of insanity defense. Mm. Mm. Uh, because narcissists know full well what's the difference between right and wrong they know what that what they are doing is wrong they just don't care they're not empathic so they don't they don't grasp intuitively or otherwise not even cognitively the effect that their actions have on others and, and they're proud they're proud of their disorder they consider the disorder they, they think that disorder makes them unique they think that the that narcissism is the next step in the evolutionary ladder, and so they are the superior race. They are, they are, you know, all others are like it's like they are the Cro-Magnons, and all other people are Neanderthals. You know? <laughs> so they're very proud of it. Now I can prove to you that narcissism is a choice, or more precisely, narcissistic traits and behaviors are actually choices, cognitive choices. I can prove it easily. If you go to jail and you're a narcissist, your behavior will change dramatically. Right. For example, no narcissist in his right mind would be grandiose in jail because he won't survive for long. Mm. So when mm. you see when you see narcissists in prison, their behavior is conformist, socially acceptable, uh, empathic, compassionate, understanding, 
etc., etc., etc. They need to coexist and survive with very, very dangerous people. So suddenly they're not narcissists anymore. Hmm. The fear instilled by prison renders narcissists suddenly totally normal. How come? If there is a constitutional problem, for instance, if you have tuberculosis, you're unlikely to lose it if you travel to another country. Hmm. You're, if you have tuberculosis, you have tuberculosis, end of story. Hmm. If it's a clinical entity, in other words, if it's a disease, you're not likely to lose it in prison or in the army or in the hospital and so on. But it's a fact that when licenses change environment, for example, they're in the army or they're in prison, they, especially in prison, because the army is a more regulated kind of, uh, but in prison, definitely, narcissists lose their narcissism, lock, stock and barrel. No trace of it is left because of the external threat. It shows me it's a learned, acquired behavior that is totally under the control and choice of the narcissist. It, uh, let's use the example of alcoholism where alcoholics get sober, they stay sober for a long time and they do that solely because they don't want to feel the way they did when they were drinking. It's a horrible life. So they made the choice to get sober. So it, it, surely the, the life, the inner landscape, the life of the narcissist must be full of uh, terror and shame. And so my question is why would at least one of them or two of them say, I don't want to be like this anymore. I want to change. Well, I, I'm not sure where you get your statistics from. <laughs> Narcissism is a positive adaptation. In other words, it helps the narcissist to obtain favorable outcomes in, mm. in the world. Mm. We live in a narcissistic civilization. Mm. It pays to be a narcissist. Mm. Mm. Actually, New Scientist, which is a, a very respected academic um, magazine of science, had a cover story in July 2016, parents uh, teach your children to be narcissists. Right. So narcissism is becoming the bon ton. Mm. A narcissist is in the White House, undoubtedly. <laughs> many narcissists are, um, are, you know, political leaders in many countries. Narcissists are in show business, in, in law enforcement, in the media, in, I mean, you name it. Yeah. Narcissism is a positive adaptation. Very few narcissists are good historians, so very few of them feel shame, as you have said, and if they do feel shame, likely they're not narcissists, but borderlines. Mm. Um, so very few narcissists have an incentive to change. For example, imagine that by some quirk of fate, I was invited to be the psychotherapist of Donald Trump. Right. What on earth, what on earth could I say to Donald Trump? Don't be a narcissist? Why? He's president of the United States. He's a multi-billionaire. He's a reality TV star. Why not to be a narcissist? <laughs> right. it's, it's a strategy that works for him. He has no incentive to not be a narcissist. And the more we, I mean, um, our current civilization with its social media, with its, uh, with its incentive structure, mm. rewards, with its exposure, with, I mean, it, it, narcissism is built into our technology, our very technologies. Narcissism is beginning to infiltrate our language. Narcissism is everywhere. Narcissism is an organizing principle of modern spectacle civilization. In 1968, there was a guy, guy called Guy Debord. Guy Debord wrote a book, a stunning, fascinating, but very difficult to read book, um, Society of the Spectacle. Hmm. And he said that emphasis would be put on, on spectacles. On, on appearances, on, on games, you know, famous for being famous. Yeah. And it's a prescient prediction. Another famous book in 1974, Christopher Latch wrote the book, The Culture of Narcissism. Every, I mean, people saw it coming, even much, much before that, a hundred years ago, there was a guy called Emil Durkheim in Vienna, mm, mm. a sociologist, so yeah. and, and he wrote a book about suicide and another book about what he called anomie. And he predicted the rise of narcissism. And of course, Sigmund Freud himself wrote an essay in 1914-15 linking narcissism to some societal phenomena. It's, we all saw it coming. Today, we would be doing young people a disservice if we disabled the narcissism. But then, Sam, it, it begs the question, <coughs> um, the, the inner landscape. I mean, are narcissists happy? Are they content? Are they... Of course, yeah. 
the vast majority of them are, are very happy. <laughs> why not? <laughs> Give me one reason why not. And, well, when they don't have narcissistic supply? <laughs> well, when they don't have narcissistic supply, when they hit rock bottom, they come to me for cold therapy, of course. But this is a, a tiny, negligible, invisible minority. Mm. The overwhelming majority are very adept at manipulating and leveraging and using other people, institutions, subverting protocols and rules and laws, especially the ones who are crossovers from narcissism to psychopathy, mm. psychopathic narcissists, mm. or what, what Kernberg used to call malignant narcissists. Mm. And so narcissists have very little incentive or reason to feel bad, ashamed, uh, deprived, uh, and so the subgroup of narcissists, passive aggressive narcissists, and they, they feel, you know, there is another group called covert narcissists and yeah. covert narcissists are simply in effect collapsed narcissists. These are narcissists who cannot obtain supply because their personality structure is such that they are shy, vulnerable, fragile, I don't know what, yes. avoidant in a way. Yes. yes. So they, these subgroups, which are very small subgroups, uh, they, but they're not, but you know what, they're not really narcissists. But, um, the covert narcissist is a kind of a cross between passive aggressive and narcissists. Mm -hmm. um, inverted narcissists, which is a clinical diagnosis I invented. The inverted narcissist is a cross between codependent and narcissist. These are the hybrids, and they are very tiny minority. The overwhelming vast majority of overt narcissists, classical narcissists, are utterly happy with their lives. And the more time passes and the more our civilization changes, mm -hmm. the more happy they are. Because they are truly far better adapted to the world of Instagram and the world of Donald Trump and you know what, even to the world of COVID-19 than all the rest of the healthy, so-called healthy normal population is. And, and the COVID narcissists, you say, are, they are not a real or complete narcissist? I, I didn't quite understand that. The covert narcissist is a cross between passive-aggressive mm. personality disorder, mm. negativistic negativistic personality disorder, mm. and a narcissist, yes, it's a full-fledged narcissist, but because it's a, it's a collapsed narcissist, a narcissist which, who cannot obtain supply owing to his personality structure, right. then he resorts to passive-aggressive measures uh, of obtaining supply via third parties or by sabotaging and undermining people. And so we have, for example, on a societal level, we have a whole community of such people. They are called inserts, involuntary celibates. These are men who fail to obtain dates and obviously fail to have sex. Mm. And so they blame this on themselves. They are passive aggressive, but they blame themselves. They say that they are ugly, they are misfits and so on, but they are also furious at women for not giving them sex. Mm. So you have, there you have a, a kind of a petri dish of covert narcissists, narcissists who fail in obtaining supply, they're somatic narcissists, they failed in obtaining supply, and so they exercise passive aggression to cope with this. Why are covert narcissists somatic, Sam? No, these are somatic covert narcissists. Oh, somatic covert, oh, I see, yes, yes, I understand. They're not cerebral. You could be somatic covert narcissists, cerebral covert narcissists. Yeah. Um, and then just a, 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 a last question, because I see we, we're over an hour, but um, you've mentioned about reclassifying narcissism uh, as a dissociative disorder rather than a personality disorder, Sam. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate on that? Actually, that's half the equation. I suggested that narcissism is actually not a personality disorder as well, mm. but a post-traumatic condition. Obviously, when we have a trauma and there are changes in personality, we immediately classify them as post-traumatic changes. Mm. So these would be post-traumatic uh, uh, conditions. But the post-trauma in this case yielded extreme dissociation. Yeah. And we have a precedent for that. Mm. Uh, in the 60s, we had something called multiple personality disorder. Mm. It was a diagnosis mm. of multiple personality disorder, which today is called dissociative identity disorder. Mm. It's when a person is exposed to extreme, usually sexual abuse, that person fractures and generates a whole a group of personalities. Mm. And these are called alters, alternative personalities. And they congregate around the central personality called the host. And I'm suggesting that narcissism is exactly a private case of multiple personalities. 
I think what happened, the narcissist as a child had been exposed to so much trauma and abuse that he couldn't take it anymore. So what happened, his personality as a child broke in half. Hmm. There were two halves. Hmm. One half one half was projected outside, and that's the false self. And one half remained inside, and that's the true self. So every narcissist, by definition, has two personalities. Everyone agrees with that. It's not me. I mean, everyone is saying this. But what I don't understand, if everyone is saying this, why not say that the narcissist is, is a case of multiple personality? Mm. I mean, by definition, he has two personalities, not one. Mm. Mm. So I think if we begin to look at narcissism from three angles, one, it's a childhood psychology problem. Mm. Two, mm. it's a post-traumatic disorder. Three, it's a case of multiple personality. We, uh, this is a very hopeful message. Why? We don't know how to treat narcissistic personality disorder, but we have perfect tools with a huge success rate in dealing with childhood disorders, mm. trauma-related disorders, and multiple personality disorders. Mm. We have tools to cope with this. We know how to treat these disorders. So if we just shift the way we look at narcissism, if we put all these tools together, we get called therapy, which is exactly what I did. Hmm. Of course, Sam. Well, it's uh, this has really been um, absolutely fascinating and informative, uh, and I thank you. really, really thank you for your for your time, Sam. Thank you and, for having. And uh, I hope you have a, a good afternoon further. You too. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.